um, address size uh, 12 to 18. Um, and with all these symptoms, um, as you would expect, her, her mood, she'd become very low in mood um, and hadn't left the house um, only for you know, things like um, grocery shopping. Um, She'd also recently been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and hypertension. Uh, she had five children. And uh, she was on um, several antihypertensive medications, as well as metformin, and recently been started on insulin glargine for her type 2 diabetes. Um, she was a housewife um, and didn't smoke, no alcohol, no drugs. And her family history wasn't known. She hadn't had any contact um, with her family since she was a child. So on examination, um, as you can appreciate from this uh, photograph, which the patient kindly um, agreed me to present to you today, uh, she had central obesity. Um, she also had acne. She was hirsute with facial plethora um, and had difficulty standing from squatting. Um, she also described difficulty in with her upper arms um, to her upper limbs in uh, loading the washing machine and um, carrying the shopping. Uh, her visual fields were full to confrontation and uh, she was obese um, as a BMI of 38. And she described herself as she said she felt having been pregnant several times before she said she felt like she was nine months pregnant with with twins. Um, Sadly, no baby, just, just uh, adiposity. So on to our first Mentimeter question. So there's the code, same one as before. Five one, okay. yep, yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, so what is your clinic? So given those symptoms and um, what we could see on, on examination, uh, what's your clinical index of suspicion for Cushing's disease? Is it low, medium, or high? Yeah. Each. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, majority of you felt that uh, this was high index uh, of suspicion for Cushing's disease. Um, and this may be because, oh, no. Yeah, that, oh, good. <laughs> um, so these are the Endocrine Society um, guidelines for diagnosis of uh, Cushing syndrome. And we can see here, as um, I've highlighted in the red box, <coughs> and that she actually had three of the four main uh, features of, um, that help best discriminate um, for Cushing syndrome. So she had the easy bruising, the facial plethora and proximal myopathy. Interestingly, she didn't have any um, reddish purple striae. She also had several of the other features mentioned in this uh, table. So her initial investigations, um, baseline cortisol was uh, markedly raised at 750 nanomoles per litre. ACTH was also raised at 82 nanograms per litre. And she failed to suppress on an overnight dexamethasone suppression test, which was 278. She went on to have a low dose dexamethasone suppression test, also failure um, to suppress there at 159. Then went on to have an MRI pituitary. And as you can appreciate here on the um, sagittal slice, there is an 11 millimeter pituitary macroadenoma, which is protruding into the sphenoid sinus. And on these coronal images, we can see that um, you can appreciate the uh, macroadenoma again, um, and it is not abutting the optic chiasm. There's, there's um, a nice amount of space there, um, hence why she didn't have a visual field defect. Okay. So on to the next question. 
what would you like to do next? Do we need to do inferior petrosal sinus sampling in this patient, or do we have enough evidence to proceed with transphenoidal surgery? What do you think? Kinda. Yeah, why yeah. Oh, okay, interesting. So just over half want to want a confirmatory IPSS. And um, yeah, 20, that's not percentage, is it? No. <laughs> 21, um, 21 uh, uh, people want to just proceed with transphenoid surgery, which I think is you know, reasonable. We've got a um, 11 millimeter macroadenoma and uh, we've got uh, strong bio biochemical evidence of um, Cushing's. So we went on and did <laughs> IPSS because uh, it's easily available here at um, Imperial. And uh, we can see here um, that. Uh, that the basal central to peripheral ratio was greater than two. This is um, a baseline before we gave CRH. And then after giving uh, CRH, we can see that um, the ratio uh, increases to over three. And in particular here at um, 10 minutes after CRH administration, uh, the plasma ACTH is 3,635 versus a peripheral um, level of ACTH of 351. So marked ratio there. So um, all of these res results were discussed in our pituitary MDT. Um, so as I just mentioned, significant central to peripheral gradient on IPSS, which excludes an ectopic source of ACTH. We've got our MRI pituitary results. The outcome of the MDT was that this, this lady needs to be listed for transphenoidal surgery um, and as soon as possible, really, given the um, high um, mor morbidity that is associated with Cushing's disease. And she's also started on the tyropone, um, starting dose 500 milligrams once a day um, and the run up to surgery. And also, of course, rivaroxaban, um, as we know that Cushing's disease is a hypercoagulable state for VT prophylaxis. So she was um, admitted to Charing Cross Hospital for her transphenoidal surgery. And the day before her surgery, as is routine um, protocol, she underwent a planning um, magnetic resonance angiography, which rather surprisingly identified three internal carotid artery aneurysms. You can see here on the right, we've got two, one at two, two millimeters and another four millimeter um, ICA aneurysm, and then one on the left as well. So yeah, as, that was a bit of, bit of a surprise. And as a result, the surgery had to be canceled. It couldn't proceed, it was too dangerous. So just to recap <coughs> our timeline here. So August, 2021, last year, she was referred for suspected Cushing's disease. The next following month went on to have um, IPSS, which excluded ectopic ACTH production, discussed in the MDT and listed for transphenoidal surgery. Um, and then that month um, it was admitted for the transphenoidal surgery, but given the um, planning MRA uh, result with the three ICA aneurysms, the surgery unfortunately had to be canceled. So surgery is canceled. What, what do we do now? So we could either do a subtotal clearance of the, um, of the pituitary adenoma, avoiding the aneurysm. Uh, we could do a bilateral genelectomy. We would need to do uh, pituitary radiotherapy with that so to uh, reduce the risk of Nelson syndrome. Or we could just manage her medically, long-term metyrophone therapy. What would you do? Oh, 
oh, okay, <laughs> bit of a um, <laughs> mixed spread, which is <laughs> which is what we like because, um, yeah, uh, subtotal clearance reasonable. Um, however, we know that there probably would be a high risk of um, regrowth. Um, bilateral adrenalectomy, not without significant risk. Um, and uh, we know um, that long-term medical man management of Cushing's disease never quite achieves um, the same uh, mortality and morbidity uh, reduction as, as surgery. So um, you know, neither of them, and none of them are, are perfect options. So what did we do? Well, she was then discussed in a neurovascular MDT. Um, and prior to this underwent a balloon occlusion test. Um, so this is a test that looks at um, the uh, collateral blood flow. Uh, so she, um, it, it was a, a test that in interventional radiology and via the femoral artery, uh, they inflate a balloon in the internal carotid artery. Um, so to block off that blood supply. And then in the contra to see if the contralateral um, internal carotid artery has sufficient uh, collateral supply. And so the way that they assess that is there's a stroke uh, registrar in the room, stroke registrar consultant in the room, um, who is assessing for any um, speech arrest or hemiparesis whilst that uh, left, uh, right internal carotid artery is occluded. And this goes on for about 20 minutes and there's serial angiography as this is going on. Um, unfortunately uh, for the patient, she did have a satisfactory cross flow from the left um, internal carotid artery um, in case that the right sided uh, ICA needs to be sacrificed. Um, however, they also noted that these aneurysms were not amenable to coil embolization, so we needed to do something else. So the outcome was they, that a um, flow diverter uh, should be inserted to close these aneurysms. And um, because there's a stent in place, there would need to be at least six months of dual antiplatelet therapy. So aspirin and prasubrel to, complete, to enable complete closure of the aneurysms. Um, and so this is uh, digital subtraction angiography or DSA. And we can see the two right ICA aneurysms here, um, the green arrows, and then the one on the left. And this is a rather nice 3D uh, reconstruction of the DSA, uh, where they've actually drawn in the stent. So it's a planning um, uh, DSA, and they've drawn in the stent here in blue. And then this is a CT head, where of course the radio opaque um, flow diverting stent can be seen. So back to our timeline, where are we now? Surgery's been canceled. We've done the balloon occlusion test and we have proceeded with a flow diverting stent insertion. So this is now December. And, and so about five months on from when she was originally referred. So then we waited three months and then she underwent an um, MR angiography to assess the uh, aneurysm to see if it had closed. And unfortunately it hadn't, closed still persisted. Waited a further three months um, and still persistent aneurysm uh, can be seen there. So we're now six months on um, from the flow diverter uh, being inserted. And all this time, remember, she's got Cushing's disease and we're having to manage this medically as best we can. So uh, her anti-diabetic medications had to be up titrated. She started on a GLP-1 agonist. Um, as were her antihypertensives. And metiropone was increased to a dose of one gram QDS. Um, she actually went on to a block and replace regime. So prednisolone four milligrams was, was added in um, with uh, regular cortisol day curves to titrate the doses of these medications. Um, so we, yeah, we've had our two MRA um, showing persistent aneurysms. And now November, 2022, um, we've actually, um, well, Dr. Vernig applied for funding for us to use um, Ocelodrostat, which is a potent 11 beta hydroxylase inhibitor um, in an attempt to have obtain better uh, control of her cortisol levels. And there's now a plan for um, 
a cerebral catheter angiography next month with a view to if the aneurysm has closed and to proceed with transphenoidal surgery for curative treatment of this lady's Cushing's disease. But that's a full 12 months on from um, when that stent was, was inserted. So all this time we've been managing this lady medically. So questions for the discussion, if we have time. Um, are there alternative medical options for long-term management of hypercortisolism that we should have explored? And as I've just mentioned, the oscillogistat is one of them. Should we have offered her a bilateral genelectomy um, back in um, October 2021 when we uh, saw these aneurysms? As that would have been a definitive cure. Thank you very much. Wow, what a case. Um, any questions from the room? I think there's one at the back there. I might just hold comments. Thank you. Is there an option for subtotal clearance followed by gamma knife therapy or serotatic radio surgery? Yeah, can I defer that question to a <laughs> neurosurgeon? <laughs> Uh, I, I, so I can answer that as neurosurgeon. The answer is yes, you, you could have done that. But I think here, that, that I've seen about three or four patients now with intracellular aneurysms. And the difficulty is knowing what the risk of it rupture is. It's actually probably quite small, interoperatively. But the problem is if it does bleed, then you're in a pretty hairy position. Um, yeah, so it's tricky. I think the risk is low, but if it happens, it's going to be bad news. It's going to be very, very difficult to control. Should, you can get it packed. You would go down to imaging that get the um, carotid coiled or ballooned off. That's why we do the balloon occlusion test before. And it's, it's comforting to know you can sacrifice a carotid if you need to. It's something we did think about. Um, but with my one of my other colleagues thought that you, know, you don't really want to sacrifice, even if you've got good cross flow, sacrificing carotid is you know, perhaps not the greatest thing in the world unless you really need to do it. But the answer to the question, subtotal and gamma knife would have been appropriate, but it still might be. In terms of risks, is there any um, radiotherapists in the room in terms of risks from the gamma knife or any other form of pituitary radiotherapy to prevent Nelson's if you went for bilateral adrenalectomy? Is that risk increased by having all that abnormal vasculature nearby? I don't think we've got any radiotherapists. Oh, in terms of uh, medical... Uh, here's for... Nigel. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not a radiotherapist. I don't do the yeah. gamma knife. I don't think there, there is a risk, actually, to, to, in terms of the aneurysm from radiotherapy, no. In terms of medical therapy, another option might be cabergolin that has had better than I remembered it having when I reviewed the literature recently, results of co cortisol lowering and also some degree of tumour shrinkage in some cases. But I know the surgeons sometimes don't like cabergolin if it toughens up the uh, tumour. Is that... Is that true? Yeah. No. So I'm not going to hug this, but I, I, no, I don't think it makes a difference, actually. I think it's historic. I'm not, I'm not bothered anymore. So I got a question in the chat here. Someone mm -hmm. wants some details about oscillogistat and why we didn't use it at the start. And the answer is it hasn't been available. It's newly licensed. In fact, it's not yet licensed in the UK. It is in Europe, but soon it will be. And then I think we might use more of it. I've never used a lot of stats, so I'm not an expert in this, but um, the way that it works would make me be slightly worried that it's it's like doing a bilateral adrenalectomy, isn't it, using it? And so do you see, or is there literature to show that there's an increase in size of a, of a Cushing's adenoma that's in place with oscillatrostat, or is that just something that we don't know because we haven't had it for long enough to know the answer? I think Pelosi, she came and gave a talk on this, and... Uh... But we had a talk at, at last in at the bit of that, and she said she hasn't seen it yet, but it's not been around long enough, probably. It's a good thought, though, isn't mm. it, actually? Because you worry that the brakes get taken off, yeah. don't you, with the cortical trophy Where was that? Florian. I think I'm just going to run to Florian. Florian's got a comment. So just to repeat for those on Zoom, this is Florian um, Vernick, who's our, our departmental expert on oscillatrostat. Thank you, Florian, who's just saying that with the five-year data that we've got, it doesn't look like there's an issue with corticotroph adenoma progression 
um, if you use it and you've got a, a residual or a, a primary not, not, not surgically operated on cortical trophy adenoma. Did this lady get worsening of her hirsutes with all that metaropone? And obviously, back in the day, we used to use ketoconazole in that setting, but obviously there's concerns about liver toxicity and escape from control with that. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I'm, I'm not actually sure. It wasn't, doc, she was using this hair removal cream on a daily basis anyway, before she even started it. But um, I'm not sure if anybody, did you? I, I do know that. I'd say that she appeared to be quite a lot better on the parapone. So, yes, yeah, so I think the comment there from Dr. Hatfield was that she's had a good clinical response there to metaroprone, and we're thinking that also the trap, I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> 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 well, yeah. Florian has a last comment, and then I think we'll need to move to the next case. But, but again, most recently, her cortisol levels have increased, so she seems to escape with metaroprone. And, and oscillotostat seems to have much less of an um, hirsute effect and much less of an effect on, on, on uh, western hirsutis and, and metaropin. Fantastic. We're going to tee up the next talk. I think there's a question from um, Marcus there while we do that. That's for Nigel. He can shout. logistics I guess. It's that whole hindsight again. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next uh, uh, case presentation will be presented by Dr. Shepard and it's the discovery and management of an ectopic pituitary tumor. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here today. I'm a South London trainee and I'm presenting a case that came across um, Kingston Hospital in the last year. Uh, it is a rare case um, and I hope we can extrapolate some of the management strategy and maybe learn a little bit about or refresh a bit about embryology as well. So, um, this is a case, yeah. Okay. You can maybe go top. Oh, it doesn't matter. So, um, so this is a case of a, I think the top is just cut off, but a 76 year old lady of Chinese origin who presented with a six year history of intermittent left sided nasal congestion, um, which was blood stained and really didn't bother her very much, but just occurred occasionally when bending forward and on exertion or exercise. Um, due to the duration of her symptoms and slightly worsening symptoms, she went to see her GP who made a referral to, for an ENT consultation. Just to note, um, she didn't have much of a past medical history except for a gallbladder polyp, which was under surveillance by gastroenterology. And she was other, otherwise very fit and well. She was a non-smoker, didn't drink alcohol, and was not on any regular medications. Uh, she didn't have any significant or relevant past family history either. Okay. During the ENT review, uh, she had a nasal endoscopy at the clinic, and it did not reveal a bleeding point. Given the duration of unilateral um, symptoms, she went on to have a CT sinus. Uh, that described an abnormal soft tissue within the right sphenoid sinus involving the cavernous sinus and also partially the pituitary fossa. Naturally, this led on to uh, carrying out an MRI scan, which I have the image here. We can see here that there is a very large lobular mass um, centered in the right sphenoid sinus. The, uh, it, it encases the right internal carotid artery as well as um, it shows some invasion into the cavernous sinus as well. 
it does invade into the pituitary fossa. However, the pituitary um, stalk had remained central. There was no compression of the optic chiasm. There was a bony erosion in the posterior margin of the sphenous, sphenoid sinus and um, into the right side of the clivus. The mass measured about 3.3 by 2.6 centimeters. She went on to have an MBT discussion at the uh, skull base MBT at St. George's Hospital. And this came up with four differentials, um, the first being a, a metastatic malignancy, a pituitary tumor because of the involvement in the pituitary fossa, a chordoma or a chondrosarcoma due to the bony involvement of the clivus. From the MDT, it was advised that uh, she should have um, some further investigations. She had normal visual fields. A CT of the thorax abdomen pelvis did, that did not show any further uh, measurable abnormality to indicate a primary malignancy. She was referred for an endocrinology workup that um, didn't show any clinical features to suggest an abnormal hormone production. And um, a full pituitary profile showed normal biochemistry. In terms of the uh, results and management of this patient, um, it was decided that she would have a complete extracellular resection of the mass. The histopathology did show that um, there was ACTH positivity with a KI 67, 67 proliferation index of um, 0.8%. The appearances are in keeping with a pituitary neuroendocrine tumor. And the immunophenotype confirmed that it is a corticotroph adenoma with a T-fit differentiation or lineage, which gives us a diagnosis that she had a silent corticotroph adenoma. She also went on to have a post-operative biochemistry and had a normal short synaptin test as well. The, the discussion points from this um, case is that it is a very, uh, she has presented with an ectopic pituitary tumor it's very rare, um, about less than 0.5% of pituitary adenomas present in ectopic locations, and particularly in the sphenoid sinus. The important uh, points to note was that she had a normal intact anterior pituitary gland. Um, in terms of workup, just based on the very non-specific sinonasal symptoms, it's, the diagnosis at the time was challenging. Uh, it was important to have multidisciplinary team approaches. She didn't, interestingly, she didn't complain of any visual nerve um, opt or balance related issues, which can occur with cavernous sinus involvement. Um, and she, don't not, she did not present with any symptoms to just abnormal hormone activity. But carrying out the anterior uh, pituitary profile, plus or minus any stimulation testing is an important part of the workup. Further to this, uh, detailed imaging studies are also critical in looking at the size and tumor margins when planning for surgery, as well as distinguishing the mass from um, a pituitary tumor extending into the sphenoid sinus rather than the other way around. The bone destruction and remodeling suggested chronicity and expansion um, in the confined anatomic location rather than actual aggression of the tumor. And when we do immunohistochemistry and pathology, it's important to um, or this highlights that the, um, the epithelial endocrine nature of the tissue, which is vital in confirming the diagnosis. Um, the ongoing management in this case will be to include surveillance imaging to monitor for regrowth. Um, I was just going to talk a little bit about ectopic sphenoid sinus pituitary adenomas. Um, so this lady had an ectopic pituitary adenoma, but if you, the definition for an ESPA is that the actual cellar and the testicular is uninvolved and the pituitary gland is normal. They are very rare. Like I said, they are less than 0.5% of all pituitary adenomas. The, the, the thinking process is that it's derived from the embryologic remnants of the raphe's pouch during the migration of the pituitary tissue through the craniopharyngeal canal. Um, they can be functional or non-functional. Um, this is just a um, picture just to remind ourselves of all the uh, anatomical locations um, when assessing patients with um, ectopic pituitary tumors. So they can, um, which I'll go into a little bit more detail. We've had a similar case presenting to um, 
oncology is apparently a nasopharyngeal carcinoma and being largely resected as such and then subsequently turning out to have a prolactin of 100,000. So. Yes, and we've seen something similar, actually. <coughs> and just for the people on Zoom, um, Nigel Mendoza's point was about um, the aggressiveness of silent corticotrophs. And I wondered if we could pick on Zani for a minute um, because of the T. Pitt lineage, because, of course, that's really a, a, an important point that you emphasised. And I'm, I'm sorry, I know I'm not chairing, but I'm just conscious that we've got Zani's expertise. So did you want to talk us for, through for a second the significance of T. Pitt? Because it's come up a bit in NDTs for us recently, hasn't it? Yeah, I get. Yeah, th thanks very much. So I guess in this scenario where there is also a clear ACTH expression by the tumour cells, it's not really diagnostically re relevant because it's confirming it is TPIT lineage uh, tumor as all ACTH adenomas are. Mm -hmm. It's more useful in instances where there is no hormone expression than looking for the lineage uh, marker for the transcription factor, which tells us which lineage it is, such as TPIT would be corticotrope adenomas, SF1 would be gonadotrope adenomas, PIT1 would be the uh, mammosomatotrope adenomas, then, then it's useful. So in it's, this instance, it just confirms that yes, indeed, it's a corticotrophic pituitary adenoma. Had it not had any hormonal expression, then it would be useful telling us this is actually still silent corticotrophic adenoma. Yeah. And I think that's a very useful point, isn't it? Just about aggression. The, the other thing which we unfortunately really don't know, the cases where there is a high proliferation fracture, fra fraction, they do behave uh, aggressively, but when it's low proliferation fracture, they still can have aggressive that's biological right. behavior. So one shouldn't really kind of think, oh, it's a very low key 67 so that's an indicator it's not going to have aggressive behavior. We, that's, it, that's not the case. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with that, and also uh, your your point is well made. I think uh, about doing a, a, another scan quite quickly, and actually, you you could almost make make an argument for going straight to some external beam radiotherapy because y y you don't want to be in the position where it's growing again, and then you're sort of trying to catch up with yourself. You you can't possibly have cured it surgically with with the best in the world. The surgeon can't cure tumor that's in bone, and so you want to control the disease and and doing so with external beam is is the right way to go. And the only other thing that I would say, and it's just a practical thing really, is that she presented with CSF rhinorrhea. So I think it's probably a good idea to vaccinate against meningitis okay. um, because these patients do sometimes come in with meningococcal meningitis because just as CSF can come down, yeah. bugs can go up. Mm. Um, yeah. And that's, that's particularly relevant to your next question, probably about if this is a prolactin secreting tumor for the same reasons. Yeah. And perhaps on that note, if we could uh, discuss discuss more about uh, instance if it was prolactin secreting tumor what would be the management perhaps you would like to go <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there are lots of experts in this room um <laughs> it, it's really difficult isn't it because when you've got a prolactinoma that's 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 invading through bone then of course you know that that when you give the dopamine agonist you will unplug the holes that have been plugged by the tumor and you'll get a csf leak um so again, it does depend on um, how light on your feet you can be. So you, you definitely want to vaccinate against meningococcal bacteria. Um, you can start the dopamine agonist if you want to. And then if you run into trouble with CSF leak, then you can just stop it. And the tumors do tend to grow back quite quickly and the CSF leak tends to stop. Um, if that is the case and you do run into trouble in terms of um, CSF leak uh, with a dopamine agonist with a prolactinoma, then actually sometimes they do respond quite nicely to, to radiotherapy. Um, and you can give radiotherapy, uh, you get a bit of fibrosis with the radiotherapy. So that sort of plugs up your, your holes in your, in your sinus. And then you can give a dopamine agonist to, to control the upward extent of the prolactinoma and to, to bring it down. Um, so you sometimes need to have a slightly kind of multifaceted approach to, to prolactinomas that involve the skull base because they can be a bit tricky to look after. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well done. Um, we're back on time. So our final case of this session is entitled um, An Atypical Presentation of Hypopituitarism, presented by Dr. Mina.
Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Dr. Raisa Minhas. I'm one of the SD4 trainees in uh, Northwest London based at Hillingdon. And uh, so I'll be presenting a case that was actually under care of Hillingdon as well as Charing Cross, primarily Charing Cross under Dr. Vernig and Dr. Tomlinson. Um, it's about 49 year old male who basically presented um, to ED at Charing Cross with cough, intermittent nosebleeds and headache. Um, he had only past medical history significant for primary hypothyroidism for which he was on maintenance leave with thyroxine. And his family history was significant for um, diagnosis of red case cyst in Braga, which was surgically removed. He wasn't, um, he didn't drink alcohol, he wasn't a smoker. There wasn't anything significant in physical examination at that time when he presented to ED and um, his baseline investigations showed um, sodium of 125, um, suppressed TSH 0.10 with a free T4-3 in range, um, suppressed cortisol as well, 9 a.m., which was some showed less than 28, and hence he was started on um, prednisone, three milligrams. Um, his prolaxins was in, in range, and he had a picture of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism with a suppressed testosterone less than 0.5. Um, so he, in the entire room, when he was um, um, admitted, he had some sort of visual um, issues as well, and a visual field assessment was done, which actually showed a left temporal superior visual field defect with normal right vision. Um, this was the first MRI that was done uh, in March when he presented to ED at that time. And um, it's, it's basically, some of the changes, not a very, apology is not a very clear picture, uh, but um, it did show some marginal enhancement um, of the pituitary and enlarged gland. And if you look at the sagittal se section as well, um, there was a sort of a thickened um, pituitary stock um, with suprasalar extension as well, um, as seen here, and a bit of cystic element um, in the center. Uh, so, um, now, he was discussed in the MDT, and um, apparently, based on the MRI findings, um, it was considered to um, do a vasculitic screen. Although looking at him, um, he did not have any sort of complaints of, um, um, or symptoms which would be in line with vasculitis, like arthralgias or rash. Um, but based on the pituitary findings, basically, either we would think of its adenoma or some sort of inflammatory process going on. So he had a workup for ANA, ANCA, ESR. ESR was raised, um, his CN cast came out positive, and um, the rest of the work, including his serum ACE levels and um, TBLA spot was negative. Um, just to be clear, his, his uh, ethnicity was he's a South Asian, his Indian origin, basically. Um, so um, in, in the interim, his um, visual symptoms got progressive, and um, a repeat visual field assessment actually showed that it had progress to um, superior bitemporal quadrantinopia. Um, a month later, his MRI was done um, uh, when he was basically just on maintenance doses of steroids, and it actually kind of showed like a spontaneous resolution of, um, of, of overall, if you look at the size of the pituitary, um, it's, it's definitely less of a, as compared to the first one. There's a bit of like um, reduction in the thickness of the stalk as well, if we say, and, and a bit of resolution of the cystic element in the, in the pituitary itself. Um, so based on the um, based on the um, imaging findings and the fact that his CN cuts were positive, um, uh, he was put on a high dose steroid of 60 milligrams from stay, with a potential plan to taper it down at some point. Uh, biopsy was um, kept in the plan if he do not if he doesn't respond to uh, steroids basically, and um, and at the same time it was basically seen he was he was started being seen in the clinic, and he started having sort of symptoms of polyuria dipsia. He had a water depth test that actually confirmed cranial DI. Um, this was approximate uh, three to four weeks after starting on steroids, and he was uh, commenced on Desmo. Uh, so this was the MRI done a month later. <laughs> Uh, after being on, on high dose steroids with potential tapering down after two weeks. And as we can see, so there was a, a potentially reduction in the size uh, of the gland. Um, there was a reduction in the cystic element as well. And the pituitary stalk thickening has actually kind of cleared up almost. And by this time, the patient had um, basically improvement in his, in his vision um, in the visual field defects that he had initially. Um, and the next MDT discussion was based on the progress that he had um, and the fact that uh, would potentially consider some steroid sparing agents. Um, so the biopsy plan that was put in place initially was deferred based on his clinical improvement and with logical improvement. He received rituximab subsequently, he received two doses, two weeks apart, and um, had a very um, good clinical improvement, radiological improvement. He was able to go back to his work. He, um, um, uh, his headaches were resolved, or clinically improved, shall I say. Um, he is still under follow-up at Charing Cross, and um, 
Well, the last letter I got access to was in September when he was feeling really well. And, and uh, there, there was a potential plan put in place for a repeat MRI and rituximab as well. Um, MRI in three months time potentially and our next retox at, uh, in January next year. So um, um, I think this, uh, the only thing, um, few bits and pieces in this case, of course. Um, the first, um, if we talk about vasculitis or um, uh, uh, potentially um, inflammation of the pituitary, uh, we got to look at the extra pituitary features as well. Um, if, he did present with a cough, uh, but however, he, his x-rays were fine. He did not have any joint pains, particularly say to consider a bone scan at some point. Um, he um, did develop saddle nose deformity, which I hadn't mentioned in this, in this presentation but it was picked up on one of the clinic visits um, and not at the time when he presented. And then sometimes we may miss it because of the masks and you know, sometimes we may not be potentially looking for it specifically. Um, the next point was how his uh, cranial DI got unmasked by um, replacing him with steroids. Uh, and um, of course the MDT discussions are extremely important in such cases, especially um, when we say that we correlate um, radiological findings um, with, with the clinical presentation of the patient. Um, and I'll leave um, this discussion with the questions basically, which uh, kind of came to my mind as well, whether um, medical treatment um, versus surgical intervention in this case, progressively uh, potentially because he had the neurological symptoms, the headache, visual field, defects, he's 39, et cetera. And next, whether biopsy should have been considered before putting him on um, rituximab potentially, if not steroids. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We're open for questions or comments. Marcus. It's a, it's a working diagnosis basis, primary so, um, I put it down as ANCA associated, um, ANCA associated hypophysitis. We didn't do biopsy to put it down to a specific diagnosis to, to say, but I think uh, this was the thing then what I actually thought about whether biopsy would make sense, especially if we talk about the long term treatment plan in such cases. He did respond to steroids, which was very positive, but um, we did not have a tissue diagnosis to say for, for, for the type of uh, hypophysitis he had. Nose deformity he did develop yes we don't have a mentimeter for, in, for this one but what's yeah, the feeling in the room would we have liked a biopsy or are we happy without mark I'd agree. And also just, it, again, it's this thing of the patient deserves a diagnosis and, and hypophysitis is not, it's not a diagnosis. It's, it's a manifestation of a systemic illness, whatever that systemic illness is. And if you don't make the diagnosis, then you, although you can certainly treat the pituitary side of the, of the disease with, with high dose steroid and within immunosuppression, what you can't do is, is to monitor the patient for the other problems that they will probably develop from their systemic inflammatory disease, whatever it turns out to be. So I think that you do need to have a biopsy. Thank you. Florian? Yes, so in this case, I actually hear quite a few features uh, consistent with polyangiitis um, and, and anchor associated vasculitis. And in particular, the PO3 antibodies are highly specific and they were elevated. And we have that as a marker and they're all normalized. He also had sinusitis, chronic sinusitis, and had a classical sudden, and now has a classical sudden nose deformity. So I think we have got quite a few features in, in keeping with um, vaginous gonorrhomatosis, and, and he has responded really well. So with, with other patients, again, we, we use the PO3 antibodies as uh, for diagnostic purposes, and, and not actually, those patients usually don't, don't undergo a, bi a biopsy or tissue diagnosis. And um, I treat this patient together in, in conjunction with my colleagues from the vasculitis team, and, and um, they have a similar approach with other patients with positive antibodies. Thank you, that's very helpful. Has, has his endocrinopathy improved with the steroid treatment? Um, sorry. sorry. It's, it's been seen by Cherry Cross team, yeah. so I don't... Yes, so it's apart from his um, um, diabetes insipidus, which is still ongoing. Perhaps the only thing from the pathology point of view, though, if I could emphasize is that 
if one then decides for whatever reason to do the biopsy subsequently when the patient's already undergone quite heavy immunosuppressive treatment, then the biopsy will most likely not be informative. So just that's kind of that balance that if one wants to know the histology, then it should be done early on. Oh, hi, it's Lisa from um, Trangos. Just say, actually, I, I saw him last in clinic recently, um, and he said, oh, he's um, peeing a lot less from the DI point of view, but it um, turned out that he'd stopped taking prenicillin for just over a week because he ran out of tablets, and he presented with a state of 116 um, post-clinic. Um, and after we gave him a week back of prednisolone, um, his um, DI re-manifested. So he's um, back on prednisolone. He's still on prednisolone and DDAVP. It's nicely reinforcing that learning point that you steroids to a mass DI, uh, Mark. Yeah, it is supposed to be GPA. I thought you were talking about diabetes insipidus. I thought you were talking about diabetes insipidus, which also has kind of a name change. AVP insufficiency. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? And on the chat, I'll have a quick look at the chat here. Yeah, the same question about prior treatment steroid altering the results. And the answer to the question, did he have a rheumatoid opinion? There's a vasculitis uh, clinic that he, the patient is being altered seen in. Okay. Wonderful. Well, we have finished on time for coffee. In fact, with four minutes to spare. Yes. Okay, thank you, everybody. So the long Zoom, we'll see you back here. Um, at 11.50, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. I've never met you, actually. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I definitely don't want to take it. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thank you. That was my support of recording quickly. And I'm Nigel Mendoza, one of the consultant neurosurgeons from Charing Cross. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ibrahim, who's going to talk about the endocrine plumbing problem. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Hassan from the Endocrine Registrars. Uh, I would like to thank organizers for giving this opportunity to uh, present our case. So um, got this patient. Um, he's a 17 year old uh, student who was training to be a plumber, um, presented with a 12 to 18 months history of polyuria and polydipsia. Uh, we also had intermittent headaches, um, and which were often daily and got worse toward the end of the day. Um, he also had anxiety due to above symptoms, particularly with the polyuria, which was stopped him from socializing with friends and going out. Um, he didn't report any visual problems, um, and uh, he uh, also noticed uh, decreased frequency of uh, morning erections and increased tiredness. So. Um, he had a fairly the symptom for a long period of time, and uh, actually it was during the first, first wave of COVID-19. Uh, at that time, he had like few consultations with his GP regarding the polyuria and polydipsia, and uh, actually the GP ruled out diabetes, um, and then was referred to the endocrine for like non-specific symptoms and uh, a bit of abnormal thyroid function. Um, so an examination uh, with the uh, endocrine when he was referred um, on the confrontation, there was uh, some possible left lower temporal uh, field defects. Um, Harvey didn't have any other clinical features of abnormal uh, hormone issues in the term of like uh, acromegaly or Cushing's. His weight uh, was 88 kilogram, giving him a BMI of 26.9, and he didn't uh, report any change in his weight recently. Now, uh, we did his initial bloods in, uh, based on his symptoms, which was uh, suggesting towards like uh, diabetes insipidus um, and also from the visual field. Um, so the uh, particularly uh, nine uh, profile showed the 9M cortisol was quite low at 34. IGF-1 was normal, um, prolactin was slightly raised, gonadotrophs were um, quite low with very low testosterone, and the uh, thyroid function was a bit abnormal, pointing toward uh, primary hypothyroidism. Um, the other blood tests, um, the serum osmolite, if you can see, is slightly on the hard side to 88, with having um, the sodium, which is on the hard side as well, and urine osmolite being uh, low at 170. 
Um, and the anti-TP was done at this stage because of the TSH being abnormal um, and it was come back to be negative. Um, so uh, following this, the result of the initial blood test, he was started immediately on hydrocortisone replacement and then uh, he was requested an urgent uh, say, uh, MRI scan. And uh, if you can see on this image on the um, coronal and sagittal, there was like um, homogeneously enhancing um, lesion supracellular and it's also centered on the infundibular and infundibular is a bit thickened. However, with the normal pituitary, there was no any um, lesions in the pituitary. And same thing here, that's the uh, supracellular mass. Um, so, uh, uh, as he had the symptoms of the polyuria and polydipsiani, he was like passing about, uh, drinking about like four uh, liters of fluid during the day and two liters at night and uh, passing a lot of urine. So we want to confirm that. So we went for the water deprivation test. Um, now, unfortunately, he misunderstood the, uh, about the fasting and when he came to the test, he was fasting. So as you see, the serum modality already was quite high in the morning. Um, so uh, that's why after a couple of hours, we um, once we had the serum modality found to be high, we moved to the next stage and uh, gave desmopressin. Um, and as you can see here, with uh, having excessively very high serum modality, his uh, urine modality was uh, hypotonic. Um, and that's uh, again a suggestion of the uh, diabetes insipidus. So following the mopressin, his uh, urine was concentrated um, and the, the volume came down. And so here he was uh, started on um, desmopressin, uh, 10 microgram intranasally twice daily. And that actually helped his symptoms uh, improve significantly. Um, he was also had the visual field check. Uh, and it showed uh, by temporal hemianopia being denser on the uh, left side. And uh, at this stage, he was uh, referred to the uh, MDT. So Queen's MDT <laughs> in hospital is the uh, local for us. Um, so um, the impression was the in the MDT was like a, it's a hypothalamic maps with a uniform enhancement, no cyst uh, or enhancement of the stalk and gland. The differentials here included a uh, hypothalamic tumor and other differentials put was uh, craniopharyngioma and cystic type, uh, germ cell tumor, optic nerve glioma, um, and also was mentioned non neoplasm less likely. Um, so at this stage, he was kept on the hydrocortisone 10 milligram twice daily and desmopressin uh, intranasally uh, 10 microgram twice daily. So in that MDT, because of his age, he was suggested to be referred to the um, uh, like a teenage and young age setting uh, for further treatment, and he was referred to the UCL uh, Queen Square for that. Now, um, so in the Queen Square, he had a lumbar puncture, uh, and the CSF fluid sample didn't show any uh, malignant cells. And also, he was uh, had blood tests for a serum tumor markers in the form of SUG and AFP, and we all come back to within normal limits. And he had a uh, PET scan there, which uh, demonstrated PET ability of the pituitary lesion. Um, and they also, for the completion and ruling out any other lesions in the central nervous system, they also did MRI of the whole spine and didn't show any um, lesions. So um, then they decided to do an, uh, a biopsy for the diagnosis of the uh, like tissue diagnosis of the lesion. Um, so um, in April uh, this year, he had a, a transplant that was uh, arranged for him, and um, the uh, histology showed that normal anterior tissue, um, which was an informative sample. And unfortunately, the sample has to be uh, the biopsy has to be repeated. And in between, he had deterioration of his uh, visual field, um, and um, so. Six weeks later, uh, the patient agreed to have the second uh, biopsy by transpenoidal surgery. And um, this time it was confirmed and uh, diagnosed of lymphocytic infundibular neurohypophysitis. Um, and um, there was no any evidence of neoplastic process in the biopsy sample uh, looked at. And therefore, it was discharged from QI service and referred to the um, tertiary endocrine team. So, um, Following the second biopsy, his uh, visual field significantly deteriorated and he had 
at this uh, point, uh, very significant visual field defects with complete <coughs> loss of vision in the lateral uh, uh, field of the left side, left eye, and only preserve of the vision on the top middle quadrant of the right eye. Um, so uh, following the second pituitary biopsy, he had uh, two to three weeks of dexamethasone, uh, apparently because he developed side effects uh, against meat and weight and the patient uh, didn't want to continue. Um, so uh, in September, he was uh, seen with the uh, endocrine team at UCL. Um, at that point, he gained significant weight. He had limited social interactions, obviously because of his uh, ongoing problems and particularly with the, uh, the, the side problem. Um, and he was delayed from, from his study for a year, obviously being outside of the, uh, from his study for ongoing uh, investigation and, um, and the management and also the two operations he had. And also there was a lot of uh, financial impacts for, uh, from them to travel to UCL for or assessments. And obviously he had multiple appointments with the oncology, um, with the uh, TY service with the neurosurgeons and with the uh, uh, rheumatology as well as seeing the patient and also uh, lately with the endocrine team there. So on examination uh, at that point, he had red strain, abdomen and thighs and the tunnel stage was four. Um, his test palatory were eight millimeter. He had normal blood pressure. However, his weight has gone significantly. Um, as if you remember from the uh, initially at around January, it was 88 kilogram and BMI gone up to uh, 55.8. So at this stage, the plan was to uh, start another trial of um, prednisolone high dose and also with omeprazole, uh, um, also for bone protection, and the patient agreed to go on that. Um, so in summary, we had a 17-year-old student who presented with a 12 to 18 months history of polyuria, polydipsia, and tiredness. Um, also, he had that was associated with intermittent headaches and lack of erections. Um, his visual field defects on testing initially was uh, detected. Uh, blood shows both anterior and posterior pituitary deficiency. Um, MRI pituitary showed uh, supracellular mass with thickened infundibulum, and he had biopsy twice, and the second biopsy confirmed lymphocytic hypophysitis. And he had a significant reduced in the quality of life over the period of the one year, particularly with his uh, reduced his vision and blame studying and also uh, financial impacts. Um, so our question for discussion, uh, first one is, should high dose steroid I mean, this considered early in this inflammatory pituitary lesion? And um, second question, uh, what psychological support should be offered to uh, this patient? Thank you. Thank you very much. So going to the first question, should high dose steroid be considered early in inflammatory disease? I think we've sort of discussed that already, that if you can get a biopsy, you should think about it early on before you start treatment. I think in this case, this is an observation that's slightly different here, because you look at that scan, you could predict you get a negative biopsy. It's, it's a supercellular lesion. Uh, you've got to transpose the pituitary gland to get near the lesion. If you're using image guidance, that's okay. I mean, it's a bit unfair because the, the surgeon who did the operation is probably not here. So there is another route in to biopsy that if you needed to. The second question I have is for Zana, the histopathologist, in terms of this diagnosis, because whilst the history is very good for lymphocytic hypophysitis, do you think the first operation would have caused an inflammatory response because the surgeons would have gone through the same route to do a biopsy? Yeah, exactly that. So that's a very good question. And I didn't know this case going to be presented and I only vaguely remember the pathology, but that was exactly discussed that A, the second biopsy was also very, very small with lymphocytic infiltrate. And one should not be based on that biopsy finding, one should not be absolutely confident that this is primary lymphocytic hypophysitis because it's second biopsy from around the same area, not long after the first initial, and therefore there could be inflammatory response to that. Plus the biopsy was so small, so that for example, germ cell tumors can have associated lymphocytic infiltrate, which again, doesn't mean that there is actually something else nasty there and we just got the periphery which is a non-specific inflamed tissue so here one should not label it as lymphocytic hypophysitis based on all those uh, caveats and one should really consider could there be an, could there be alternative diagnosis no comment. 
I, I, I completely agree. So um, th there's lots of things in this case that would make me worry that this, this lad has a germ cell tumour. Uh, it's a supracellar mass. Uh, you don't have proper diagnose, diagnostic um, biopsy for the reasons we've talked about. He's presented with really profound DI, which and also pubertal arrest, which suggests that it's been going on for a little while, which again would not go with lymphocytic hypophysitis. He's male and he's young. So all of those things, I think, make me think that this is a germ cell tumour, and I think that you need to go after that diagnosis. Sometimes when you do the RP, you can actually measure the alpha feed protein and the beta HCG in the CSF, and that's much, much more sensitive than the blood. So the blood's often negative in a germ cell tumour for HCG and alpha feed protein, but the CSF is often positive. So that might be something that you might want to think about, or uh, as Mr Mendoza has said, you might actually just want to to try and do another biopsy because otherwise you don't know what you're dealing with and you, you're, not, you're not actually treating the problem. And also just to add on that, that if it's germinoma, then even the CSF the markers should be negative. When be, it's because it's a different kind of germ cell tumor which is not producing the, uh, the, the hormones you can detect. So negative CSF or blood findings does not exclude germinoma. I'm against it being a German end, the pineal gland region looks normal. I think you've got a possibility of other diagnosis like an optic nerve glioma, which might be why the vision got worse after the biopsy, or a germinoma, despite no pineal. So I think you need to check the CSF again, um, or a hypothalamic glioma. The fact is, on the steroids, you're going to know it in about three months when you re scan them, because I assume if it's inflammatory, it would have got smaller, but still won't have a diagnosis. Okay, and then there's a quick question here from Zoom, which is, um, how often does lymphocytic hypophysitis present with a supercellular mass like this? Unusual, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Well, as a mass, it's unusual. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's normally a thickened stalk. I don't think it's a cranio. I've not seen a CT scan, but it's not cystic. It doesn't seem to be any calcification on it. Okay, and there's a question here. The negative PET, would that reassure you that it's unlikely to be a germinoma? Am I a nuclear physicist as well now? <laughs> <laughs> You're an expert on everything, Nigel. The answer is no, it probably wouldn't. Um, thank you. This, presenting these really difficult cases, this is how we all learn, so thank you for that. And um, just on a more sort of low-level thing, um, I just wonder if we think the water, <coughs> formal water deprivation test was necessary, given what you kind of knew about the patient in terms of the history and the, the imaging that you had, whether you could have made a presumptive diagnosis of, of the eye, if you want to comment. Uh, yeah, um, I, I think just kind of uh, for confirmation, uh, uh, because obviously we didn't know what we were dealing with. Um, obviously we had the MRIs come short, uh, um, like a lesion, um, but obviously we wanted just up for confirmation uh, with the water deprivation test. Um, but otherwise, I mean, obviously, if in a patient which is not suitable or whether it was during COVID time uh, where we couldn't, couldn't do uh, what the prevention test, we could have started him on empirical treatment with the uh, desmopressin. Okay. Any, any other questions from the floor? Just on the question of DI, I mean, how many units are using copeptin now rather than the old style investigations? We, we, we have started and we it's difficult we, we're, we're doing both in parallel and and i'm not really convinced that copeptin is is the answer for our patients it might be for patients who've got nephrogenic di but we don't have that problem in our clinic so we haven't found it useful yet but we're doing lots of parallel assays at the same time one more question at the back OK, 
Okay, if you want to you can take that. Why not? <laughs> I, I don't think I know the answer, but I, I would I would surmise that yes, it was protective in terms of the um, the ACTH deficiency that he had primary hypothyroidism. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think Anna's point about the weight gain, are you suggesting that maybe there's some hypothalamic involvement of this and therefore it might be something other than lymphocytic hypothyroidism? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's a really interesting case. It would be great if you could feed back to us, perhaps present it again next year, because it's really interesting to know what happens and if you actually come up with a diagnosis. It'd be a great learning point. Yeah, it is very important we learn. Yeah, it would be a great learning point to bring it back. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. So our next case is actually being presented on Zoom in this multimedia forum. So this is a challenging case of recurrent Cushing's disease after an episode of pituitary apoplexy. And the presenter is Dr. Alamiri um, on behalf of a, of a big specialist team. So hopefully you'll be able to make the technology work. I think he has. Okay, well done. Well done, Marjorie. Do you want to uh, go into that mode and start speaking? And we can't hear you yet. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, do you want to just a bit louder if you can? Okay. <laughs> Okay, shall I start? Go ahead. Yes, do you want to start? Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your attendance. My name is Majid, I'm one of the endocrine fellows, and today I will be presenting a challenging case of recurrent Cushing disease after an episode of pituitary apoplexy. Now, we have a 33-year-old lady with a background history of type 2 diabetes, primary hypothyroidism, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and obesity. She presented initially with a sudden onset severe headache. An examination showed a complete left side ptosis and ophthalmoplegia involving third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerve. Now, her home medication included levothyroxine, 75 microgram daily, metformin, 500 milligram daily. And on further clinical examination, Revealed the gradual weight gain, worsening acne, oligomenorrhea, and symptoms of proximal myopathy, as you can see in these pictures. Now, initial investigation, including sodium, potassium, and hemoglobin, were all normal. TSH of 7, HbA1c of 48, cortisol 513, and ACTH of 17. And the rest of pituitary hormonal axis were intact. And the ECG showed a normal sinus rhythm. Now, she had a CT head with contrast, which showed a heterogeneous area of signal hyperintensity within the pituitary gland, as you can see here, pointed by the red arrow. And there was no intracranial hemorrhage or acute infarct. And because of initial presentation and finding on the CT scan, she had an MRI pituitary with contrast. On image one, you can see uh, this is a sagittal T2 weighted pituitary MRI sequence with contrast, showing a large cellular mass, as you can see here in the red dotted line. Uh, with a small volume hemorrhage. Now on image two, you can see this is a coronal T2 weighted pituitary MRI showing a cellular mass extending into the left cavernous sinus. And there was no optic chasm compression. Now all of these findings were in keeping with pituitary apoplexy and the visual fields were normal bilaterally. Now, this case was discussed at our pituitary MDT. And in summary, this is a pituitary apoplexy with ptosis, third, fourth, and sixth grade nerve palsy. Clinically, the patient was cushionoid. She had a normal level of consciousness with glass coma scale of 15 over 15, normal visual feed acuity, and visual fields bilaterally. And during that time, the MDT recommendations were there was no indication for immediate surgical intervention and to arrange further dynamic assessment of cortisol access, including cortisol daycare with ACTH, late night cellular cortisol, overnight dexamethasone suppression test, and to repeat the MRI pituitary in three months. Now, during the follow-up, she had a number of cortisol daycares uh, in May, uh, approximately two weeks after initial presentation of apoplexy, she was found to have a low morning cortisol of 72, and low levels on the uh, cortisol daycare of 133, 49, 47, and 67. And at that point, she was started on prednisolone three milligram every day. Now by June, 2021, her cortisol level were done off prednisolone and 
cortisol daycare suggested possible recovery of ACTH cortisol access. And at that point, the prednisolone was stopped. By September, as you can see on the left side, cortisol levels were much higher, suggesting cortisol excess. Now, she continued to have a follow-up uh, with a number of uh, biochemical assessments. As you can see in this table, this is a late night salivary cortisol. Uh, she had uh, normal uh, levels of cortisol and cortisone in September 2021. And by November 2021, both of them, cortisol of 6.1 and cortisone 36, were both elevated. She had also a low dose dexamethasone suppression test in October and the cortisol of 100 with ACTH of 103. Now, clinically, she showed the clear signs of cortisol excess, recurrent infections in the ear, vaginal infection, and tooth infections. She had insomnia and worsening diabetes and further weight gain. Now, radiological follow-up, um, she had an MRI by September, which showed the resolution of pituitary hemorrhage. During that time, pituitary MDT um, agreed that despite resolution of the hemorrhage, there was no discrete pituitary target lesion seen on the pituitary MRI to direct the surgery. And the functional imaging with methionine PET was recommended to localize any possible functional lesion to aid or direct the surgery. And the patient was started on VTA prophylaxis. Metarapone was started initially at 500 milligram twice daily and then increased to 500 milligram at 12 p.m. and one gram at 6 p.m. once daily. Now, the patient had the methionine PET scan, and this is a, a functional imaging study. And basically, in methionine PET scan, we are looking at the intensity of the tracer uptake. And the tracer in this case is amino acid-based tracer. So an image aid, there is a distinct area of suspicion around the left optic nerve and left uh, nerve sheath approaching the temporal nerve here, as you can see, maybe my cursor. Now an image B, uh, there is a, it showed um, a left side tumor extending posteriorly and laterally to the, in the left cavernous sinus. And this was more than what was initially suspected from previous imaging with the tracer uptake. And this was suggestive of functioning active disease. Now, um, with all of these valuable information and data from the studies, uh, Pituitary MDT um, reviewed the, the, all the data and there was no, the lesion was basically not amenable to transplanodal surgery as a curative option. Uh, and the tumor could not be fully resected due to its uh, challenging location. So what's next? And I kept this bit uh, to be a bit interactive question to the attending audience. And before going to the question, I just want to uh, present the timeline of the events. So we have uh, this lady who presented with the pituitary apoplexy in early May. Initially, she had a normal cortisol axis. In mid or late May, uh, she developed cortisol deficiency and she was started on prednisolone three milligram. Now by June, she achieved cortisol axis recovery and stopped prednisolone. By September, she was showing a clear signs of cortisol excess with recurrent infection, weight gain, and worsening of her diabetes. Now, by November, it's very obvious that she was having cortisol excess confirmed with a number of bio, uh, biochemical and functional imaging studies. However, there was no clear surgical tar target identified, at least not amoebable to surgery. Now, if you kindly go to uh, mentimeter.com and if you, can you see that? Yeah, we can. Hope you look okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's, um, yeah, it's distributed. Yeah, it, but never mind, that's, that's very quick, okay? <laughs> yes. yes, okay. So I will stop sharing that. I will go back to my slides. Okay. So that was interesting. Thank you. You didn't tell us what the answer, what people chose. It was a bit fast. Oh, sorry. So the most people went with E. Uh, that's bilateral adrenalectomy followed by pituitary uh, radiotherapy. Although all five of them had some votes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. yes. 
Shall I go back to that? No, no, it's fine. Thank you. I think okay. we've got it. Thank you. Can you see the slides now? We can. Okay. So the case was um, at, at the NDT, the recommendation uh, or the advice was to uh, proceed with bilateral adrenectomy uh, followed by pituitary radiotherapy. And that's what happened. The patient underwent surgery um, by end of March 2022 and post-op adrenal histology uh, showed adrenal cortical hyperplasia in keeping with Cushing disease. Now, the patient at that time, she was started on prednisone 4 milligram and fludrocortisone 125 microgram daily. Now, during the follow-up, the patient was doing very well postoperatively. Uh, she had uh, a regular period, she was losing weight, she was sleeping better. And as you can see here on this graph, so after the surgery, she was losing weight and to aid more of weight loss uh, or the boost the weight loss, she was started on semaglutide in July, 2022. And the patient was later on toward the end of the year, she was key for a pregnancy. Now, uh, she was planned for pituitary MRI, and this, uh, this was almost six months post-op. So on uh, image A here, as you can see, uh, there was a finding of enlargement of pituitary tumor and the, with some ICA encasement. Image B uh, shows uh, the retrocellular extension behind the clevis. MHC expansion of the left foramenal valve, paracellar and inflorocellar, and the skull and the skull base extension, and there was uh, some spread into the orbital space, as you can see in image D here. The ACTH level was repeated uh, in May and October. Uh, by October, it was two thousand and two hundred twenty-seven. So the case was discussed recently at our pituitary MDT, and the plan was to arrange uh, the radiotherapy as soon as possible. So the patient is undergoing radiotherapy. So the take home message, uh, vigilant and continued clinical and biochemical monitoring of the patients who experience apparent resolution of function of a functional uh, pituitary tumor following pituitary apoplexy is essential as in, we have seen in this case. And this case highlights the importance of MDT approach with utilization of state-of-the-art functional uh, imaging such as uh, methionine PET uh, to aid the decision-making in challenging cases. And I want to end up the presentation by uh, some questions maybe for open floor uh, for the discussion for the audience and for the panel. So would you manage this case, this patient uh, differently? Would you manage uh, uh, this patient differently in regards to the primary treatment of Cushing disease relapse? Or would you consider other treatment options, uh, other treatment medical options? And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much and for doing so brilliantly with the technology. So a very interesting case. You'll probably have a lot of different opinions. I think we already have some comments from could I be controversial and say, given it's a diagnosis exclusion, the PCOS that kind of sprung up in the beginning of the history, was that really PCOS or was that the beginning of this whole process? Uh, can I answer that? Oh, yes, do. Yes, I'm <laughs> yes. oh, sorry. That was a very good uh, question, actually. Yes, it was PCOS indeed. She had a number of... Uh, tests uh, to exclude if there is a possibility of cortisol excess, including number of uh, late night cerebral cortisol. And although the low specificity and specificity of the urine, it was collected and it was low. Uh, so both these uh, tests, two late night cerebral cortisol and cortisone within the normal range and uh, urine cortisol level uh, within the normal range. Uh, it was done in different hospital, with, but we do have the records that it was normal. Uh, that's an excellent question. Thank you. In time, I think if there's a concern that's changing, then we can do that. So, do you want to check the chat for a minute? Just I'm conscious uh, that people on Zoom may have some questions too, because it's such a good case. There's a question about could this have been cyclical because it was normal once and abnormal at other times? It's interesting. I think that that low cortisol that we saw immediate or very early post apoplexy, I think we thought that was necrotic, sad unhappy tissue and that then it sort of resurrects you know after some <coughs> period of time that it sort of showed its true colors again so I see where the cyclical questions come from but to my mind it was 
necrosis in the context of apoplexy. And then, as I say, it sort of showed its true colours again quite quickly. A good question. Anything else in the uh, chat or OK? No, so thank you. I think in the interest of time, you need, you need me to move on. So I'd like to ask Dr. Motion to come and talk about endocrinopathies in patients. Yes, Dr. Motion. 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 On Zoom, endocrinopathies in patients on checkpoint inhibitors. Why ongoing checks are essential? <laughs> Um, can you all see my slides? Yeah, we can, and we can hear you too. Excellent. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, endocrinopathies in patients on uh, checkpoint inhibitors, why ongoing checks are essential. Apologies uh, if my voice is a bit hoarse. I'm just recovering uh, from flu. Okay, so the objectives of this talk are to describe the clinical presentation of endocrine side effects from immunotherapy. Now, we know that immunotherapy has really changed the landscape of uh, treatment with cancer, and it's increased the survival for many patients with inoperable tumors. And the way it works is that it modulates the immune system. And we know cancer cells have manipulated the immune system so as to alter the effect of T cells and escape from their effect. Um, and what these checkpoint inhibitors do is that they block this effect so that the body's own T cells can destroy the cancer cells. But in the process of doing so, it has resulted in a new host of side effects due to loss of self-tolerance, particularly involving the endocrine organs. Um, so we know about radiotherapy, chemotherapy. So this is a new landscape uh, of, not so new, but a, new, a relatively new landscape of side effects from uh, the use of immunotherapy on the endocrine system. And the second objective is to signpost guidelines available now, uh, because these patients present a little bit differently from the other endocrine patients we see, right? Okay, moving on to the patient history. We have a 63-year-old gentleman, no significant past medical history. A new diagnosis in metastatic uh, melanoma, uh, stage three, but on further imaging, it was now found to spread to the lungs and the liver. And so the uh, only option for him was to be commenced on combination of immunotherapy, which is nivolumab and ipilimumab. So already we can see that we're going to anticipate some problems uh, because these are two different classes of checkpoint inhibitors. Nivolumab acts on the anti-PD-1 or anti-program cell death ligand, and ipilimumab acts on the CTL4, or the cytotoxic lymphocyte 4 receptor. And both are known to be associated with different kind of uh, endocrine dysfunction, and we're using both of them together. So uh, I don't have an audience response system, but I hope um, I hope this will make things a bit interesting. I've uh, put the lab results as I found them on ice uh, to follow the story uh, of what happened to the patient after each cycle of immunotherapy. Of note, each cycle of immunotherapy is about three weeks apart, and we can see how the results change uh, for him. So before starting immunotherapy, this was 2018, so about four years ago, we can see that the blood tests are all from an endocrine perspective, completely normal. And then after the first cycle, we can see something's already gone wrong. Um, as you can all see, the TSH is suppressed and the 3T3 3, uh, 3 3 and the 3T4 uh, are raised. Uh, in the context of immunotherapy, this is pre predominantly due to um, a thyroiditis-like picture with release of free thyroid hormones causing this initial uh, thyrotoxic phase. Uh, so the management, as with regular thyroiditis, is just symptomatic. Moving along. Um, so this is where we are at the moment. We have the thyroiditis-like picture. The patient gets another cycle of immunotherapy about three weeks later. And let's see what's happened now. Okay, so the TSH is normalized. So this uh, confirms that it is likely a thyroiditis. If not, the thyroid antibodies were negative and the uptake scan was also negative. Uh, the glucose has started to go up. Cortisol and prolactin are normal. The glucose may be up because of stress, hypoglycemia. We don't know exactly. Maybe the patient received corticosteroids. He's a cancer patient. Maybe something happened. But we do know that immunotherapy is associated with autoimmune infection of the pancreatic glands leading to type 1 diabetes. And the initial HbA1c was normal. So this needs, uh, this needs to be observed. Okay, so the TSH is normalized, elevated glucose levels, normal cortisol and prolactin. Right. Moving ahead now, we've got the third cycle. 
And a lot of things have, are going on now in this, um, in this picture. We do the thyroid first because it's occupying three rows to get it out, get it out of the way. So we have the thyroiditis, a euthyroid picture, and now the patient has become frankly hypothyroid uh, with a raised TSH and undetectable free thyroid hormone levels. The glucose has gone up and the patient is ketotic and acidotic. New diagnosis of type 1 diabetes was made. Anti-GAD antibodies were sent off and they came back later on to be positive. The C-peptide is still pretty all right, but follow-up blood tests uh, done showed undetectable C-peptide levels as well. Cortisol is fine, appropriately raised considering the stress. Appropriate, um, or you would say, hypo, the hyponatremia is likely from the hypoglycemia. The prolactin has fallen off, indicating that perhaps, perhaps the pituitary is starting to get affected. All right, so after the Fed cycle, he was admitted for raised glucose levels, treated uh, as DKA, started on a basal bolus regimen, and 75 micrograms of thyroxine was started as well. And moving along. So now these were all scheduled bloods, uh, cycle one, cycle two, cycle three. Now the patient presented to A&E with hypotension, blood pressure 95 over 75, extreme fatigue, and generally a feeling of, of not feeling well at all. And here are the bloods taken, which are unscheduled. We could be given the thyroxine, but not successful yet uh, at treating the hypothyroidism. Glucose is all right. But the most notable feature here is that the cortisol is only 44. Uh, the ACTH was measured later, and it was undetectable. So we've got cortisol deficiency with associated hyponatremia. And I've got the thyroid uh, involved. We've got type 1 diabetes low prolactin and acute cortisol deficiency treated appropriately uh, with hydrocortisone followed by oral steroid replacement. And uh, this is the imaging that was carried out. The CT cap didn't show any problem with the adrenals, no bilateral adrenal hemorrhage, no evidence of the tumor, which is actually good news. Uh, the MRI of the pituitary done post cycle four did not show any, any evidence of hypophysitis. But from the literature, if we don't find anything, it doesn't mean we won't find any endocrine problems. But if we do find evidence of hypophysitis and the hormones are normal, it means we should closely follow the hormones as, may, as they may start to drop off next. We need to do the imaging because um, if you're giving patient immunotherapy, there are some rare case uh, studies showing the presence of inflammatory mass, which can obstruct the optic chiasm, uh, which may require emergent glucocorticoids. And of course, the other reasons are to exclude other causes in cancer patients, such as hemorrhage or metastases uh, to the pituitary gland. Okay, moving along, the clinical course. So in view of significant autoimmune toxicities, the fourth dose of immunotherapy was not given, and maintenance immunotherapy was also not given. The melanoma remains in remission for the last four years, and this is, this is a silver lining, because it has been seen usually, but of course not in everybody, that when there is a strong uh, reaction in the form of autoimmune toxicities from the immunotherapy, this means the therapy is generally working very well on the cancer itself. And this is indeed the case for this gentleman who remains well four years later with a good quality of life, performance score of zero, he's moved out of Oxford. I think he's in Southampton at the moment. The endocrine deficiency is our permanent feature as is expected with immunotherapy specifically involving uh, the cortisol ACTH levels. And he remains uh, he remains uh, with replacement, uh, re replacement of thyroxine, um, insulin, and hydrocortisone. So, so to conclude, endocrine complications of checkpoint inhibitors are very well recognized. Biochemical monitoring and interdepartmental collaboration are essential uh, between the endocrinologists and the oncologists because patients need to be, need to be aware um, that this is a complication that is likely to happen. Uh, with the incidence being about 10 to 17 percent with combination immunotherapy in particular. Severe endocrine sequelae may predict superior melanoma outcomes. So, a silver lining uh, when you take everything else into uh, consideration. There are some guidelines available uh, produced um, to describe how you can manage uh, the endocrine complications of checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Um, and some more guidelines on the diagnosis um, for further reading if needed. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the team at Octon, um, as it has been a team collaboration uh, with the diabetologists, endocrinologists, of course, the oncologists, the nurses, uh, and all our patients, especially this patient, was graciously allowed uh, for this case to be shown.
The topics for discussion, um, any special features of this case and some general takeaways for the management of patients with endocrinopathies on immunotherapy. What I will do is I'll just go back to the picture in which it had all the endocrine abnormalities all together in case uh, this may be relevant to discussion. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much from, from a neuroscience. That's a very interesting case. Are there any questions on the web on the chat to begin with? So that we don't leave them out. Okay, I'll leave them out. Why was the fourth dose not given uh, of immunotherapy? That's an interesting question. But can you repeat that? Uh, what, the fourth dose of immunotherapy, which was working very well, was not given. I think, Zainab, because you said there were some side effects. Do you mean as in endocrine side effects, because it sounds like you're on replacement. But now the current guidelines are exactly right. The current guidelines say that there is no need to stop immunotherapy uh, because uh, they, uh, he's already gotten all the severe complications of cortisol deficiency and type 1 diabetes. So from, uh, from a hormonal perspective or from an endocrine perspective, and from the current guidelines, there's no indication to not giving further doses. But I believe this was a discussion with the patient who just wasn't comfortable carrying on, even though he was educated, that nothing significantly worse could happen because the worst has already happened, if that makes sense. It's an interesting learning point, I think, because Karim always says very wisely, that he's looking at me now puzzled, but he does, uh, to say, look, you know, we can take care of all the endocrine stuff, they just need to keep going with the oncology, which I always think is a really helpful message just at, from an educational point of view, because I think actually you've seen that, in fact, we can manage the endocrine stuff. I think there's Lisa here for a minute. Thanks so much, Seema. Um, can you just tell us again what the ACTH was and were you querying a hypothesitis or a genitalitis, because you put both on the slide? Of course, uh, the ACTH, or oh, I think uh, perhaps my slides weren't very clear. I'm sorry about that. The ACTH was less than five, undetectable when measured. An undetectable ACTH. That's right. Yes. Um, I would just, that, what a lovely case. Um, I would just uh, caution you, though, uh, in assuming that the hyponatremia was because of glucocorticoid deficiency, because with these drugs, you can get multiple different glands involved, as you've just shown us. And uh, I have a case, a patient who's exactly the same, and actually he had both ACTH deficiency and mineral corticoid deficiency. So I, I wouldn't be, um, <laughs> be encouraged by the CT scan of his adrenal glands looking normal because they might not look normal in a few months' time, and you probably want to measure arenin and aldosterone just to be absolutely sure. And, you do well, and, and if, yes, and if, yeah. yeah. The potassium level, if it's available. Uh, the potassium level was, yes, thank you. The potassium level was normal. Uh, I tried to put it on the slide, but then it was getting too busy, so I left it out. Don't worry, it, it was beautiful. Don't time. worry at all. Mark, I can pass you this, actually. I just, I want to ask about organ-specific autoantibodies. Did you, you mentioned thyroid, did you? What about GAD? Is it, has there any help? Yes, uh, yeah. the GAD antibody. Is there, is there any merit in you know screening for these in these patients? You know, because obviously we're looking out for the complications biochemically, but patients that might have a, an early warning if they've got positivity. Uh, so from the literature, um, at least fifty percent of patients have one positive autoantibody, either it's anti-GAD or anti-ILAC antibodies, but it doesn't happen universally. And uh, the Japanese group have actually published a fulminant. Uh, a fulminant uh, case series of fulminant DKA, where the presentation is flu-like symptoms, uh, the patient going very quickly from being viewed glycemic to having DKA, and negative antibodies, uh, which they describe as a separate um, phenotype, a separate subtype, which may follow pathogenesis, which is completely different. They're quite variable. I think that's what the literature says, in fairness. I think there was a Question on Zoom. Yeah, question on oh, Zoom. Oh, sorry, yes, there's also one on Zoom. Yes, thank you. That was a wonderful case. Uh, I was just wondering about the uh, if there was any positivity in uh, thyroid antibody like uh, it had with the anti GAD. I didn't get it. Was the question it... was whether there was any positive thyroid antibodies. They were negative. The okay. thyroid uh, peroxidase antibody was negative, uh, but the thyroid receptor antibody was not measured. There's a question on the chat, which I think is, is, a, is a good one um, in terms of 
what is the likelihood of recovery? Um, I guess we should maybe think about the pituitary, since it's a, we can talk about all the uh, glands, but since we're in a pituitary meeting, what's the possibility of recovery? Did you want to talk to us about uh, what your thoughts are about the recovery of the pituitary hormone deficiencies? Of course, uh, from the literature, um, with regards to cortico corticotropes, that is uh, cortisol ACTH recovery, uh, it's almost always permanent, all right? Uh, okay. But with regards to the other axes, the gonadotrophs and the uh, thyrotrophs, so there is variable degrees of recovery with a variable frequency. I think for the gonadotrophs, it was 17 to 40%, and the thyrotrophs, it was something quite similar. So not as permanent, but mostly the literature cites uh, that um, ACTH deficiency is permanent. It's very interesting, actually, because I looked at this recently. So we had a student looking, and uh, the corticotrophs, there's, some, there's something to suggest the corticotrophs express CTLA-4, mm -hmm. but not PD-1, which is why you get this combination is particularly tricky for hypophysitis that picks off corticotrophs. Um, so, and then... Yes. Yeah. Uh, doesn't, the ones we've looked at in our, uh, in our trust, none of them have recovered. It's all been permanent. Uh, but I've had a patient who has had ACTH deficiency and then transient um, secondary hypogonadism. And actually the secondary hypogonadism resolved beautifully, but the ACTH deficiency has remained. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. I won't press any question, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I think is quite significant is prolactin deficiency, because that tells you about the extent of hypopituitarism, doesn't it? It's quite profound when you have prolactin going down. So, so I think the likelihood of, of recovery of pituitary function is quite slim. Thank you very much for that comment. Actually, uh, the same group at Oxford looked at um, whether see the low prolactin levels preceded the low cortisol levels to see whether this could be used as a predictive value. And this was a very small cohort, maybe about 46 patients. So they found that there was 97% specificity of a low prolactin predicting a low cortisol in the future, but the sensitivity was quite low. I think it was 50, around 50%. I can't remember the exact value, but I can I'll look it up and get back to you, All right? And the other thing is, uh, as Dr. Martin was saying, uh, the ipilimumab, uh, which is the anti-CTL4 uh, inhibitor. This is just really this classic picture because uh, they, uh, this is the one that causes the irreversible cortisol deficiency and it's very, very classically seen after cyclostomy. Thank you. So that's really interesting what you just said. So you're saying that the, prolat the low prolactin can be a predictor because it fell before the cortisol fell. Is that correct? Yes, but this is, uh, this is a very small, this is according to a very small um, case report which was published in a, as an abstract in BES in 2019, which was looked at by the same uh, group in Oxford, I think it was in Noronha. Um, and this is what they said, that there is more specificity, but less sensitivity of the use of prolactin. Well, thank you. That was really interesting. I think thank you very much. That was great. Well, we're setting up for the next one, just a small plea, because I think as an onco endocrinologist and oncologist, we're very kind of on this, but it is important for all of us to make sure our a &E departments are equally on it because if patients present with suggestive symptoms on these agents that they think about, obviously, uh, you know, some form of adrenal insufficiency and, and measure the cortisol and treat it because we don't want these patients dying of something entirely preventable. So our next um, speaker, so um, Dr. Macronidis, um, who is presenting hypopituitarism and hypothalamic obesity following craniopharyngioma with a perspective of um, chronic disease management. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm a um, clinical lecturer from um, UCLH, and I'll talk you through a case that I've sort of uh, been involved with over um, a number of years now, both in the endocrine and um, bariatric clinics. So this is a gentleman who's now 31 years of age, who um, comes and sees both to our endocrine and our bariatric clinics at UCLH. He was first referred to our endocrine service at the age of, of 18, back in 2012, with a history of craniopharyngioma, panhypopetriotism with diabetes insipidus and hypothalamic obesity. In terms of his um, history, he, was, he first presented at the age of nine. Uh, the first presentation was with headaches, hyperphagia and uh, daytime somnolence. And uh, he had imaging done at the time, which confirmed a large craniopharyngioma with um, hypothalamic invasion. Um, he originally had a drainage of a cystic component done in 2000, followed by a transphenoidal resection in 2001. 
he had a recurrence shortly after in 2002 where he was uh, with, where he had really extensive disease unfortunately i couldn't get hold of the images but he had a bilateral craniotomy at the time with a frontal resection that was in 2002 and this was followed by a course of uh, stereotactic radiotherapy with a total dose of 50 gray which completed in 2002. Um, he presented with um, endocrinopathy quite early on, so already after the first post-operative uh, period, he had a STH deficiency, and he was commenced on hydrocortisone, um, subsequently had an acute presentation of, uh, of DI in that first hospital admission, and he was discharged uh, on hydrocortisone, desmopressin, and levothyroxine at the time. He was established on, uh, on hormone replacement. He had growth hormone deficiency as well, and he went through puberty induction with uh, testosterone treatment. Um, prior to transition to adult care, he had an insulin tolerance test, which, which confirmed ACTH and uh, growth hormone deficiency, and he was referred to adult services established on a, um, stable doses of levothyroxine, hydrocortisone, uh, growth hormone, testosterone gel, and um, nasal desmopressin. In terms of his weight history, he was a healthy weight or up to and prior to the presentation at the age of nine. But already early on in his presentation, he had really aggressive food, food seeking behaviors with hyperphagia, nocturnal hunger, um, trading food for toys with other children at school, and really quite severe and accelerated weight gain following his uh, first surgical resection. So through his sort of pubertal years, he had a weight gain of 56 kilograms over a period of four years, with only just a um, gain of three centimeters in height during that time. And in terms of his uh, height, he sort of slightly exceeded his parental height, so he's uh, pretty much the height of his father. Um, so there was no funding of growth with a weight gain. In terms of other medical history, he unfortunately developed a bow leg deformity, which had a really severe impact on his mobility, which was exacerbated, which was made a lot worse by the rapid um, rapid weight gain. He required a series of collect of sort of corrective surgical procedures by orthopedic to try to restore his mobility, and he was walking with. Um, with crutches at the age of 19. Um, he developed type 2 diabetes as well, that was treated on metformin at the time. And in terms of his social history, he lived with his mother, his younger sisters, he completed A-levels and he had a aim to study at university. Um, he was not um, drinking or smoking. So in terms of his management, subsequently he was referred to the uh, bariatric service and he went through the um, bariatric MDT. It was confirmed that he was well established in terms of his um, of his endocrine replacement on the hydrocortisone and uh, desmopressin, and he underwent a sleeve gastrectomy in 2010, which was very fairly sort of uneventful with a mild sort of transit hypernatremia um, in the immediately post-operative period, but no other um, complications. You can see in terms of his weight trajectory, he did achieve um, weight loss of about 25 kilograms, which is just about 15% of his original weight. Um, but he unfortunately had full weight regain by three years after, um, from surgery, which in sort of definitions of bariatric surgery outcomes would, come, would sort of come under the definition of a poor response or sort of uh, with complete um, weight gain. But in terms of his actual story, he during that time and with the weight loss, his um, hyperphagia well, improved uh, considerably to the point where he was able to have a fairly sort of normal social life. He went off to uh, from London to Birmingham to go to university and he completed a degree in business studies. And his mobility improved quite a lot at the time. So he was able to um, go out and walk independently despite sort of needing crutches. So for him, this was sort of quite a successful outcome in the fact that he managed to go and pursue his studies during that time. Unfortunately, things deteriorated uh, from there. In terms of his craniopharyngioma surveillance, this was managed, this was followed up by the, uh, by the Queen Square Pituitary MDT. Um, there were a lot of challenges in terms of, first of all, obtaining imaging due to, uh, due to his weight, um, but this was successfully done eventually on the upright scanner and he has um, stable appearances on his MRI scans with um, no further requirement for treatment. In terms of his metabolic disease, this progressed quite significantly. He developed um, the recurrence of his type 2 diabetes, which was originally in remission following his sleep gastrectomy. He got obstructive sleep apnea, requiring CPAP, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. And in terms of his pituitary hormone replacement, this was assessed quite regularly with an aim to sort of keep the hydrocortisone dose at the lowest dose required. He continued on growth hormone, dysmopressin, testosterone, and thyroxine. Um, unfortunately, the hyperphagia became really quite a prominent issue again, and he had really quite rapid weight, weight gain. Um, when his diabetes recurred, he had a trial of liraglutide originally at the diabetes dose, then at the obesity dose, when that became licensed, but he had no response, neither in terms of his HbA1c improving, nor in terms of his weight to that. 
And at the time he went to see a dietitian, and it became obvious that he was drinking quite a huge amounts. So he was drinking several liters of fluid, but actually of really sort of sugary um, drinks at the time. Um, and there was a clear sort of overlap one from one which underpinned that of the polydipsia and the hydrophagia manifesting themselves as that. So he was consuming huge amounts of sort of very high energy dense liquids in order to sort of address both at the same time. Unfortunately, his mobility deteriorated quite significantly and he was wheelchair bound and almost unable to do anything for himself anymore by 2021. Um, and he went to move back in with his family and he became completely dependent by the, uh, by the end of the COVID pandemic, which also obviously had a really substantial impact on his well-being, his confidence and his quality of life as well. And in terms of his weight, uh, at the end of uh, 2014, he had a weight of 184 kilos with a BMI of 67. By the end of the, uh, of the COVID lockdowns at the start of this year, his weight had increased to 222 kilograms with a BMI of 80. So in terms of when he was able to sort of come back um, face to face, first of all, he had all of his uh, pituitary, we looked at all the pituitary hormone replacements and his doses of the CDOVP were titrated. Um, he had quite a lot of work with one of the bariatric dietitians in terms of trying to really differentiate between the thirst, the hunger, and sort of try to manage these with a minimal sort of um, energy intake. Um, and then after that, he went through a supervised low energy liquid diet program to try and reverse some of the uh, weight gain with a preparation to um, further bariatric surgery, which was extensively discussed both in the uh, pituitary and the bariatric MBTs in terms of whether this could be the right or not thing to do at the time. Um, and he was offered a trial of either the diabetes dosimaglutide when this came out or a option to go through a revision or bariatric procedure. And he opted to have uh, further bariatric surgery. So in um, May of this year, he had a revisional one of osteomosis gastric bypass um, with sort of very close supervision of his, uh, of his sodium uh, and um, sort of perioperative hydrocortisone where there were no complications and his sodium remained completely stable. And he made a very good sort of post-operative recovery from that. Um, his type 2 diabetes is back in remission. He'd lost um, six kilos in the first post-operative month. His weight now is around 175 kilograms um, a few months down the line. And importantly, he's able to walk again. He's able to uh, rely on the support of his family a lot less. And he's been able to go back to work for the first time since 2013, um, having had a marked really improvement of his, um, of his quality of life. Obviously, this, as far as we know, is the first case of uh, revisional bariatric surgery that we know of in somebody who's had, uh, who's got hypothalamic obesity following a craniopharyngioma. So we don't really know what the outcome is going to be and how uh, likely he is to regain the weight again um, following this. So the, the points I want to bring for discussion is really how do we prioritize the chronic disease management in somebody like this, who's got an enormous cardiovascular risk and really sort of complex health challenges, and how do we assess the outcomes and the success of these interventions? Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a very um, a beautiful, holistic, really holistic, um, pre a presentation of a case that's very, very hard. Again, you know, discussing these difficult cases is, is so helpful, and they're cases that I'm sure we all recognise. Um, can I invite comments from um, from the room? Got a comment right at the back. No, 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 don't no, say no, 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 because we need the people on Zoom to be able to hear. <laughs> Hi, uh, do we have a cortisol day curve on him? The, the, real question, the reason for that is we should try to keep his side of the cortisol at the lower end as far as possible. So do we have a cortisol day curve? On yeah, him? so he does. He usually goes in for a day curve every couple of years. Um, he, his last day curve was done just prior to his, uh, to his revisional surgery. And uh, on a dose of 10.5, he was sort of averaging cortisol levels around 300 in the morning, 200 later in the afternoon. Uh, his next one's booked for the autumn, but we do do them quite regularly to aim, to, like say, aim to keep the lowest hydrocortisone requirements possible. Could I ask a quick question? Just um, you mentioned that he um, you started to give him CPAP, and whether that or any other sort of interventions in relation to sleep disorders, um, you know, have been thought about to try and improve, you know, metabolic health and, and energy levels and things. Yeah, so he's still on his CPAP, um, he's under the sleep services um, as well. He had a trial of melatonin for the sort of somnolence and the circadian rhythm disturbance. He didn't benefit from that at all, so that was stopped. And he's going to have another sort of sleep study to look at the need for CPAP 
um, depending on what happens in six months from his um, from his procedure, which will be the start of the year. This is quite challenging, isn't it? It's centrally driven, so the drive will remain for life. Um, there are, but I think the future is bright. Uh, I mean, I moved to industry from to Sierra from from clinical practice. There are lots of treatment options coming up for central obesity. It'll be fine. <laughs> um, can I ask that one? Lovely, thank you. And and we all of us have these patients in our clinic, and they are so hard to look after. Um, can I ask two questions? First is why do you think his uh, drive to eat went away with the sleeve procedure, the hyperphagia, if it's just centrally driven? What what, what was that all about then? So the presumption for that is that by taking out the majority of his stomach, that even though it's centrally driven, that there's some peripheral uptake of ghrelin as well from the stomach that can sort of contribute to that, and that the drop in that can theoretically transiently suppress appetite. Obviously, the central drive takes over again, and we saw that with his hyperphagia coming back and the weight gain. And, and then the, about thirst, does, does he have thirst? Or because many patients don't have thirst, and, and actually they are drinking for reasons other than <laughs> thirst. He does have a thirst perception. So. Would you trial semaglutide as a question here? Yes, absolutely. So, the question, so the question is whether we would trial semaglutide, um, and that is definitely one of the sort of next steps to consider. So obviously, by the time um, this was discussed prior to the prior to the re revisional surgery, um, he, he at the time he opted to go straight to the uh, to the procedure. The theory obviously is that there's semaglutide is more likely to work than semaglutide, given that there is sort of and thalamic independent mechanisms of action. So hopefully by the time some maglutide becomes available for obesity, he'll be about a year following his surgery. So we'll know weight will have done. So the idea will be a point in the screen for him to Can you explain a bit more about the difference between semaglutide and liraglutide, sir? So semaglutide is slightly more is more potent than liraglutide in the first place. But the other yeah, so the other reason why uh, with the some data suggesting that semaglutide may have a role in people who have uh, who have hypothalamic components to their obesity is that it has hypothalamic independent mechanism that such as higher CNS penetrance and it reaches GLP-1 receptors that are outside the hypothalamus of the CNS. And the dual agonists are on the way as well. So. Good. Any other comments or questions for this presentation? If not, I think we have a slightly early lunch break, but thank you so much to all of the presenters. It's been a really interesting session. <laughs>
So what a real pleasure to uh, be here presenting to you all today. My name is Arthur Dalton, I'm a neurosurgeon. And um, I actually completed my training relatively recently in 2017, and then spent three years doing fellowships abroad in Canada and here in London, finishing up here at Imperial under the tutelage of Nigel Mendoza and Ramesh Nair. And I've been privileged to work alongside them in a consultant capacity for nearly the last three years. Um, my first exposure to pituitary pathology, however, was very early in my career when I was a young senior house officer in ITU in Southampton. And I spent many hours poring over an unfortunate patient in ITU and had a reaction a little bit like this. This unfortunate chap in his 30s um, had some pretty innocuous symptoms, a bit of nasal stuffiness, had a biopsy of a presumed nasal polyp in an ENT outpatient clinic. Of course, the histology was anything but. It was a prolactinoma. And everyone was shocked to find the MRI scan a little bit like this one. I'm afraid this wasn't his scan. This is a, an image from Google. Um, this was before I had no idea that I might be standing here giving a talk about pituitary surgery. So I didn't think to keep his image. But it was very extensive. It eroded his skull base and was extending here, there, and everywhere. He was treated with carbergalin, and of course, it began to shrink very rapidly, and that's when his problem began. So as the thing receded and exposed this large defect in the skull base, he started leaking CSF. Um, he uh, eventually collapsed and then woke up in ITU blind, deaf, uh, multiple cranial neuropathies, bilateral fascia nerve palsies, couldn't talk. We had to communicate with him by tracing letters on the palm of his hand, and he would scribble his responses on a piece of paper. Um, and then worse still, actually, every time we sat him up or tried to stand up, <clears throat> he would um, drop his GCS, he'd come unconscious. He had to be flat in bed the whole time. And it was all felt to be some slumping effect of his brain just moving downwards in his skull due to this large bony defect in his skull base. So uh, that was a pretty, pretty upsetting case. Um, and luckily I realized that you know, pituitary pathology isn't always like this. And from a surgical point of view, there is quite a lot to be said for it. Um, sometimes it's all very exciting and urgent, although not quite as glamorous as uh, on the TV. And oftentimes it's pretty um, uh, slower paced and one's got time to think about the options, talk to one's colleagues, discuss it and make a careful plan. Um, but best of all, I think it really requires a team approach and um, yeah, there's a, uh, your outcomes for the patient are undoubtedly improved when we all sort of pull together. And I think in Imperial, we've got a really nice team. Um, and despite some heated debate now and again, um, we do sort of work together to get a good outcome for our patients. And I'm very fortunate to be part of the team. So thank you very much. Um, this talk on the challenges of pituitary surgery, I tried to include some interesting cases that I hope will have some educational benefit. And maybe to get greater benefit, I thought I would just cover some basic anatomy and sort of surgical technique. And I appreciate it might be a little bit of uh, more surgical content that you, you normally get in your day-to-day um, -day practices. Um, you're aware that there are two main ways really of operating on pituitary tumors um, via a microscope. Um, even through the nose with nasal speculum and through the sphenoid sinus with a microscope. Um, most centers probably by and large have moved towards an endoscope where you deliver the light source and the lens of your camera up close to the tumor and sort of bypass the narrow channel and the obstruction. Um, undoubtedly you get better opt optics and visualization. As to that, whether that really translates into better outcomes um, is a little bit more open for debate and and not absolutely um, uh, proven. But yeah, in, in our institution, we use the endoscopic approach by and large. And it really gives you a very nice view, certainly the anterior posterior plane. So front to back, you can get to pathology right up to the anterior frontal lobe and all the way down to the odontoid peg uh, behind which you find the medulla and the upper spinal cord. Um, the limitation really is the lateral view. So you're, you've got this narrow band with which you can easily access with the endoscope via an endonasal transfernoidal approach. Um, and that lateral extension is limited, uh, broadly speaking, as a rule of thumb, 
to the limit to delineated by the orbital apices. So if you think as your think of your orbit as a cone, and the apex of that cone being the optic canal where the optic nerve is leaving, um, that's roughly your your lateral extension, that lateral limit. And uh, the image on the right show an MRI scan and coronal view with the, that sort of lateral limit highlighted by their red lines. And the image on the left is a uh, view of an endoscope at the back of the sphenoid. So that's the posterior aspect of the sphenoid covering the pituitary gland and other various structures. This is a cadaveric specimen. So it's minus the blood, which of course makes surgery a little bit more awkward and you might have to rely on your wits and uh, uh, anatomy rather than these nice bumps and grooves and things. But I could just point out your carotid prominences here and here, which would be where your internal carotid artery is lying within the cavernous sinuses. And this is the central part where your pituitary fossa is, your pituitary gland here. This little hollow declivity, shadowy recess, optico-carotid recess between the carotid artery and the optic prominence where the optic nerve is running the optic nerve is running from the chiasm in the midline towards the orbital apex here. So you can actually even drill out and decompress the optic nerve from this area endoscopically if you need to. Um, and uh, this little hollow beneath the pituitary gland is your clival recess. So if you remove that bone of the clivus, you come to the basilar artery in the front of your pons. And uh, if you really go really laterally, just to the limit of your view, you can actually go lateral to the cavernous sinus, to the medial temporal lobe and uncover the, the dura, hiding the temporal pole here and the medial temporal lobe here. Um, so where does pituitary surgery challenge? Uh, lots of scenarios, really. You could have horrible, large, invasive tumors like the, like the first image I showed. Some pathologies have rather aggressive character traits and might require multiple resections, adjuvant treatments, radiation, et cetera, et cetera. And then your difficulty of surgery increases with scarred tissues and if you lose your nasal lining. Uh, it's a bit like having poor quality skin. So when it comes to closing up and repairing at the end, you might not have much tissue to, to close up. Um, and then undoubtedly, you've got some awkward anatomical relations as shown on the previous slide. And uh, troublesome complications can really pose a, a nightmare to the treating surgeon. When I asked my senior colleague, what he thought was the most significant operative challenge. This was his answer. <laughs> um, Saurabh Sinha, who was actually originally penciled in to give this presentation, once grilled me in a revision course for my exams. And he asked me the same sort of question, Arthur, what's the single most important factor which might determine the relative ease of your pituitary surgery and your outcome? And after fumbling around rather awkwardly for an uh, um, inadequate answer, he put me out on misery and said tumor consistency or tumor texture. And, and this is a nice case from my first fellowship in Canada. And you've got this classic appearance of the snowman inside view. This is the pituitary adenoma. It's bulging into the sphenoid sinus, this chamber here, and the head of the snowman poking up through the diaphragma cella into the underside of the brain. You can see the optic nerve just being stretched upwards there. And I uh, hope this works. Yeah, so oops. on the uh, T2 view, it shows it up very nicely. You've got this very dark area here, which almost looks like the same signal you get with the flow voids of the arteries. This is the internal carotid artery here, seen looping around in the cavernous sinus and your middle cerebral artery here, your anterior cerebral arteries here and here. And this dark area, it's not blood, it's actually calcification, calcium. And um, as we saw on our in the patient's preoperative CT, they've got a bony snowman sitting in their pituitary fossa indenting their brain. So we were worried that this would be very heavily calcified. It might be impossible to actually debulk and maybe we would have to more aggressively dissect around the outside of the tumor. And then would we have difficulty where it was stuck to the optic nerve or the ACOM complex, the anterior cerebral arteries? It'd like to be a high risk of CSF leak, because if you think about draped over the head of that snowman, you've got your diaphragma cella, which is a cling film like uh, layer of arachnoid um, holding your brain uh, cerebrospinal fluid in place. A high risk of CSF leak and likely high risk of residual tumor. So we've got a little video here. I'm not going to show too much of it. You've all had your lunch, so hopefully it will be okay. 
Um, once we sort of drill through the back of the sphenoid and get to the tumor, uh, you can see this is, the, this is actually the tumor here. And when you move it, it's just moving as one large block. So rather than being able to sort of suck it out and scoop it out, you're having to take it out piecemeal. The soft parts are actually like wet sand, you know, gritty sand. And then the, most of it were large lumps, like a, like a little stone in the pituitary gland. Anyway, so um, large chunks eventually delivered. Uh, here we go. This is the, one of the large pieces just sort of being dissected nicely from my supervisor at the time from the diaphragm cellar above. Gradually mobilizing this little stone out of the pituitary fossa. And there it is, about two centimeters. Um, so this patient um, developed some hypopituitarism post-op. Was actually discharged only four days later by some miracle. I didn't have a CSF leak. Uh, visual fields had improved, and eventually, longer longer term follow up, the pituitary function also improved. Histology revealed a TSH secreting tumor with quite a high KI sixty seven index. And the postoperative scan, unsurprisingly, did show quite significant residual. With the eye of faith, you can see that this upper calcified part has actually dropped down somewhat, so taking some of the pressure at least off the optic apparatus. So what do we do about it? Um, well, surgery was very challenging the first operation. It did take a while, rather a long time. And it was felt that we were quite high risk trying to get this uppermost part still stuck to the uh, blood vessels at the top there. So we kept close radiological and surveillance of the optic uh, you know, visual function and also treated with octrotide, I believe. Structural relations. Um, they often pose a challenge. So this is the circular Willis. You've got your internal carotid artery coming up here, your anterior cerebral artery coming up here, your anterior communicating, contralateral anterior cerebral, back to your internal carotid, posterior communicating, posterior cerebral. So think of this as an arterial halo around the head of your snowman. And um, that can uh, be a little bit awkward at times with very large tumors where these are all distorted or even encased by the pathology. And Leila, thank you very much for presenting so clearly. Our, uh, one of our patients with this problem with aneurysms just burrowing into the tumor there at the front um, and a real dilemma, this lady who was very symptomatic with Cushing's and initially felt be quite urgent from a surgical point of view, but has actually been very nicely managed medically and, and, and controlled, allowing um, breathing space for her aneurysms to be treated by a flow diverting stent. Um, and, uh, you know, knowing that we have got the other options in our back pocket, should she not really tolerate the medical therapy and or, or, or escape control. Um, this is another case in our series, a 58 year old lady, rather obese with obstructive sleep apnea, um, who was a little bit awkward to diagnose from a biochemical point of view not entirely convinced whether there was, it was Cushing's, it was felt to have subclinical Cushing's perhaps, or maybe a, a rapid metabolizer of dexamethasone. She had progressive visual field deficits and um, a macroadenoma distorting a chiasm. So she was planned for surgery and her image on the right preoperative shows this little uh, flow void indenting the tumor anteriorly. So rather like our first case, her, tumor, her surgery was um, delayed pending some investigations. And similar to our other case as well, the endovascular radiologists felt that the only way of treating this was with a flow diverting stent. One hopes, of course, if you can coil it without the need for antiplatelet therapy, then maybe you can protect this aneurysm much more quickly and proceed with surgery more quickly. Um, however, when you have to insert a flow diverting stent, then rather like a cardiac stent, you have a risk of stent blockage. And that risk is really quite high in the early post-procedural period. So dual antiplatelets for six months is the standard protocol in most institutions and single agent for two years. And of course, one could consider shortening this, but we don't really have a great deal of experience to know, you know uh, how um, quickly the, the risk will drop 
um, and how early one can stop these antiplatelet agents. And similarly, we don't really have that clear an idea of how quickly flow diverting stents might work in terms of closing down the uh, aneurysm, because by and large, we don't have to scrutinize these patients and, and we're not champing at the bit to operate on them. You know, we just stent them and they have their usual routine follow up a year or two down the line. This particularly did have surgery. So she uh, underwent surgery. I was fortunate to operate on this lady with Mr. Mendoza and um, the tumor consistency was favorable, was very soft. So a good debulking was achieved, chiasm decompressed, um, some residual left. Uh, we were pretty cautious around the aneurysm anteriorly and, and inferiorly in the uh, fossa. Yeah. Um, well, the histology did show strong staining for ACTH and T-fit lineage, and our, our current feeling is that she's probably a silent corticotroph uh, adenoma, which, you know, is an awkward, challenging pathology in its own right, quite recurrent, resistant uh, tumours. Um, we considered upfront early post-op radiotherapy, but she had quite a good resection, um, so the feeling was we would keep it under close surveillance with the option to retreat or give radiotherapy if it does recur. This is another case of large macroadenoma in a um, lady uh, with um, incental finding actually. And she did actually have a subtle visual field deficit. Um, however, her symptoms were relatively mild. She hadn't noticed it herself. Um, she presented, I think, early in the pandemic. And so her treatment was kind of delayed anyway, and her vision was stable. So again, the full discussion about options, felt that a flow diverting stent was the only real suitable treatment. And we've elected to observe her. She's had her treatment. And that's quite interesting because we've had a chance to watch the result of the, of the stenting. Um, so this is, a, this is a digital subtraction angiogram. So this image here, right at the start, the contrast just been administered. It's whooshing up through the internal clotted artery. Now it's reaching the small uh, arteries, more distal. And you can just, with the eye of faith, see the aneurysm filling here. So it's maybe just slowly beginning to fill. This is the late arterial phase going into the venous phase. So now the veins are beginning to fill and the contrast is actually washing out of the arteries. And you can more convincingly still see the aneurysm. And then this is the late arterial phase. So the contrast is washed out of the arteries completely. It's now just in the veins and it's still pooling and, and static in the aneurysm itself. This is actually two years after a stent procedure. Um, you know, the stent is actually quite a uh, not very dense mesh. So blood can flow through the wall of the, of the stent. And really, if you're still under antiplatelet therapy, then potentially your aneurysm is not actually shutting down and closing off completely until you come off. She was still on aspirin at this point. So aspirin's been stopped and a plan to repeat the angiogram in a year's time. Um, so how often do we see aneurysms in pituitary tumors? Um, overall, aneurysm prevalence is pretty, pretty, pretty rare, actually, 0.4%, 3%. Um, it's felt that the prevalence is a bit higher in any form of brain tumor and highest of all associated with pituitaries. But there isn't a huge amount of literature out there, so I don't think we can really answer this question very accurately, but it ranges up to 7%, sort of up to seven times as likely than the general population. I think that's probably an overestimate. Um, the most comprehensive review of aneurysms associated with pituitary tumors that I could find was actually from a rather lesser known publication of the Journal of Neuroscience and Rural Practice. Uh, but it was a very helpful article and, and actually, you know, pretty useful, I think, and um, probably the best that we've got. So four to six articles included 105 patients. And when we're looking at the location of the, aneurys uh, the, location of the aneurysms, then nearly two thirds, the orange and blue, is on the internal carotid artery, with most of it being in the cavernous segment, as we've seen in our cases. Um, and then after the carotid, you've got the anterior communicating and the anterior cerebral arteries. So the majority, if you think of this, you know, uh, part of the pie, will be very close to or likely intimately related to the tumor. So probably there is some subtle etiological factor, maybe, of having a tumor up against your arterial arterial wall. And maybe forming an aneurysm, who knows? Um, <clears throat> and then more distant would be a much smaller proportion. And then looking at the um, pathology of the uh, histological pathology associated with the aneurysm, 
most of them being this blue in non-functioning. Maybe that's just the fact that non-functioning is quite a common group, um, not too sure. Growth hormone secreting also and prolactin secreting quite high. Look at this, it's quite interesting, I thought. ACTH, Cushing's disease, actually a very, very tiny proportion of the cases published in the literature, 2%. I think it was, you know, uh, like three cases or something. So not many published out there. Um, and as for management, it's likely very variable and tailored to the patient. I mean, kind of what you expect with a, a hodgepodge of uh, reported cases in a small review and very few Cushing's cases to really guide us on how we should treat our difficult patients with Cushing's and an aneurysm. Um, so other challenges, um, giant and invasive tumors, we've already sort of hinted at that. This was a, a case from our series, um, a 60 year old female with a stuffy nose and a visual field deficit and rather invasive looking lesion. This image on the left doesn't really do justice. It's actually growing all the way into the nose as well. And um, of note, you've got circumferential encasement within the cavernous sinus here on the right, encasement of your carotid. So that's basically probably unresectable to get a, to get a complete resection around that, and certainly challenging. And then this part up here, going to be dipping over the anterior uh, cerebral arteries and the middle cerebral arteries. So again, pretty awkward and growing right up into the third ventricle. Um, she did go for a debulking. And this is the early post-op scan, sorry, limited picture, but you can see the signals changed quite a lot internally. So this is likely a, it's quite a significant debulk of the central regions, largely residual left in the cavernous sinus around the carotid, and it's probably some residual, fairly significant residual up at this top right-hand aspect. Um, and uh, this is the early three-month post-op scan, and unfortunately it's grown back, bulked up quite considerably, even just in a three-month interval. And this is another patient with a silent corticotrophic adenoma. So this supposedly benign tumor really behaving in a rather more malignant way. And we've got other patients, difficult patients who've had multiple resections, been treated with, I think, paziriotide and chemotilazolamide and had radi radiation, multiple surgeries and whatnot. And a lot of patients, I think, don't really get full control and may even succumb to this, this tumor. And this particular patient, um, she's actually planned for a craniotomy to try and tackle a little bit more of this supracellar component um, with greater visualization early on of these arteries and probably better able to tackle around them. Um, and uh, <coughs> just nearly, nearly, nearly coming to an end. Uh, another case on my fellowship um, of a patient with Cushing's disease and rather invasive looking tumor. So it's in fully encased around the carotid here. Um, and uh, it's just illustrating that you can go lateral to the cavernous sinus. So this is that central view of the back of the sphenoid. And this is actually the dura of the medial temporal lobe. The cavernous sinus will be sort of in between it here. Um, anyway, we sort of uh, debulked. And when we got to the middle fossa component, and you start to sort of unplug the cavernous sinus itself, you get pretty brisk venous bleeding, welling up into your field of view, which is quite challenging. Um, and you, we rely on our, um, sort of injections of thrombin uh, material to, to, to stop that bleeding. So future considerations, um, from a surgical point of view, there's quite an excited development um, uh, in the endoscopic community, which is a transorbital neuroendoscopic approach or a tones approach. And uh, you know, displacing the globe of the uh, the eye, and sending your endoscope through the orbit into the back of the brain, and giving you a greater lateral extension, um, and potentially robots, um, robotic instrumentation, robotic assisted surgery, might be something that we can uh, add to our armamentarium, and also medical therapies. Um, so I'll just end it there. I didn't. <laughs> Didn't quite get to surgical complications, which I probably should have. But <laughs> thank you, thanks, Arda. Brilliant talk. Um, you covered, I think, most of the challenges in future surgery we face. I'm not sure how many neurosurgeons are there on the Zoom. So it's just probably just you and me. So <laughs> they have to depend on us. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever we say, you have to 
Exactly. Whatever she goes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so that case, I think that calcified TSH tumor. I thought it was unusual to see pit calcified tumor, pituitary tumor getting calcified. I, I don't remember seeing another mm. calcified pituitary. Interesting yeah. case. And as you say, the, the tumor extension can be a challenge, especially going into the cranial cavity, middle cranial fossa, or anterior cranial fossa, and also into the cavernous sinus. But as you also correctly mentioned, it's often the tumor consistency and the texture of tumor that really makes it really complex or mm. easy. I, I think that is a valuable point. And uh, from, a, from your perspective, when we leave tumor behind, uh, you often find that you know, we, we leave it behind uh, often fearing further complication if you were, were to attempt further resection because beyond a certain point, any further step you take will have carry a much multiplied risk related to the actual case including CSF leak or other complication related to vasculature. So in some cases, when you try to attempt to, to remove more tumors, you may feel that there's a risk of CSF leak, even though it's not an unusual complication for us. Some patients, it may be a, a significant complication that will prolong their hospital stay, and some of the CSF leak can be very difficult to manage, especially patients with the undiagnosed or latent intracranial hypertension or hydrocephalus, they may never heal up. And so we will end up keeping them lumbar drain as going back to theater, multiple operations, we've had several patients like that. So that sort of experience when you have, you tend to leave some tumor behind and you know that there's a possibility. Otherwise, I don't think there is anything that I would particularly say at this stage, but I will um, ask for any further questions. There are a few questions up there, yes. Do you see any relationship whatsoever between the tumor consistency and the cell type? Um, yes, we, we do. Um, I mean, by and large, the majority of tumors are relatively soft. Um, uh, sometimes they're a little bit more sort of fibrous and rubbery. Um, I, in terms of functioning tumors, I think Ramesh, you probably got a little bit more experience than I have in terms I agree. of I think it's, ones it's, that are variable. Yeah, so it's often we find pushing tumor, they tend to be more soft and creamy and they, you often you recognize by their nature. Once you open up, you see that they're more softer they actually ooze out, that tissue oozes out uh, when you open it up. But uh, some of the tumors can be more fibrous, including acromegaly uh, tumors. Uh, the more, what we find that um, sometimes it can be correlated preoperatively with some scans, especially the T2-weighted sequence. I wish there was some radiologist uh, here. But then when you see a hyperintense T2 signal, you mean, that means that there's more water content in the tumor. So you know beforehand that you would expect possible softer tumor that will help you with the operation. But apart from that, I don't think the, uh, in terms of non-functioning tumors, one particular cell type is, you can predict that they're going to be more softer or, I think it's, it sometimes can be very variable. Yeah, and it depends on how long the tumor has been there and, and, and the, whether it's the calcification. There's certainly no hard and, and fast rule, is there? Well, there's certainly no hard and fast rule. There's no hard and fast rule, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, that was really fascinating. Um, just a quick question, I was just intrigued by your last slide about the new approaches to pituitary surgery. Is that likely to be happening anytime soon? When well, we're removing eyeballs? our first case in January. Nigel uh, Mendoza will be doing a case in the, in the beginning of January. Um, but not much experience yet in this country. Um, some groups in South Africa have, have uh, done quite a few cases in this way. So it's a relatively uh, novel approach, yeah. And that, that will be kind of reserved to particularly tricky anatomical pituitary masses. I think remove. when you're developing um, an experience, you've got to be pretty careful in your selection and, um, you know, try and choose pathology and, and cases where you really think, hey, there's going to be a benefit, um, but perhaps uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a, a lesion which will be well suited to this approach rather than a sort of yeah. very large, um, extensive, um, awkward looking lesion. Yeah. You just literally remove the eye, do you? They don't remove the eye. Um, I, I, I personally have very limited experience in it. Um, you can make a little incision in the eyelid and you can just put a retractor in and depress the ice ball and just move it across uh, laterally or inferiorly, or you can just squash it a little bit. Yeah, push it on one side. Brute force and ignorance. <laughs> Thank you for an interesting talk. I, the, if, he, if someone has had a radiotherapy before and there's a regrowth of the tumor, how is it 
easy or challenging if you have to go into for debunking? Well, um, I think by and large, it doesn't make a vast difference. Uh, again, I'll probably have to defer to my more senior colleagues who've done more of these difficult cases than I have. I, I know that um, some surgeons say that in some settings, it seems to make it a little bit harder. It might be a little bit more fibrous, a little bit more stuck to the adjacent structures. And occasionally other surgeons say, well, actually, it almost gives you a, a sort of a better plane between your adjacent structures. Um, I, I, there isn't really a hard and fast rule, but it does make you nervous. Radiation in particular, damaging the uh, viability of your lining of your nasal cavity. And you, for these sort of extended approaches, a difficult approach, you need a flap, which is um, a bit of your nasal septum mucosa, usually, which you then strip off the nasal septum and rotate up and stick on the skull base. So if you haven't got much healthy tissue that you can strip off and mobilize, then you, you might have a difficulty in closing up. You can take fasciolata, which is covering from the thigh muscle, um, and sort of stick it up there. And there are various other bits and bobs you can do, but it, it, it's, it is an important consideration in terms of finishing the job. Yeah, I think uh, just to add on to that uh, point about the uh, post-radiotherapy patient post of that uh, a challenge to neurosurgeons. After surgery, their healing may be impaired, as Ada was talking about. If they get a leak, we will struggle to repair the leak, and they may not heal up very well. But also, in addition to that, post-radiotherapy patient may have a slightly more higher risk of having if there is a vascular problem, if it is invasive into the cavernous sinus, we'll be very reluctant to go into cavernous sinus because they, the carotid wall is more friable and once radiated, then they don't have that kind of elasticity. So we'll be very uh, circumstantial about to go in back into the cavernous sinus in that just cases. Right. Um, There's a question from the chat, sorry, just for 10 seconds, if yeah. that's all right. So uh, maybe for Arthur specifically to start with, do you get routine pre-op MRA for pituitary patients, presumably thinking about your case and Layla's uh, about the aneurysms where it all sort of came to light? Uh, basically, we like to have the image guidance, which is sat-nav for the brain, and you need a high-resolution CT scan because that's very accurate for what we call registration. So in other words, being able to sort of superimpose the imaging onto the facial anatomy, a CT scan is very, very helpful. And then you can either use a CT angiogram, which will show up the arteries very nicely, and you can merge those modalities together for your image guidance, or you can use an MR angiogram. Um, we actually just like using an MR angiogram and fuse that to our CT scan and use that for our image guidance. We'd always have an MRI pituitary, and um, we get an MR angiogram uh, with all our patients. But in other institutions, they don't use the M MR angiogram, they use a CT angiogram. It's just sort of Reference really. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. That's it from the chat, actually. I think that's it from the chat. Okay, fine. Um, should we go on to the next speaker then? So we have a talk on role of surgery in improving fertility in, in a patient with prolactinoma from Dr. Mahmoud. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bashir Mahmoud. I'm going to give a talk on uh, the role of surgery in improving prolactinoma in a patient. We had a 10-year journey with this patient. This uh, patient was, management was supervised by Professor Gideon Malawa, who's also with us today. Um, so let me start. So our journey with this patient started in 2015 when she was referred from her GP to our endocrine team. Um, at this point, she was reporting six to seven years history of uh, aminuria. Her GP did a blood profile for her. One of the tests he did request, luckily, was the prolactin levels, which showed was very elevated at the time, 3,700. At this point, he then proceeded to refer her to the endocrine team. She was started on quinoglide. However, <laughs> Her prolactin levels did come down, but then she reported having severe side effects with it. She reported having nausea, vomiting, dizziness, headache, despite the prolactins improving. So at this point, it was decided that her, the quinacolide will be stopped for her and we would change it to cabagolin. She then goes a few months without any, any follow-up. And then when she does come back, is because she's admitted to the hospital. 
because her mom could not wake her up. On admission, uh, she also reported having ongoing side effects with the cabagulin. However, she also reports having two periods in the time between being started on cabagulin and being admitted to the hospital with the with unable to wake up, less as you feeling generally unwell. She also reports that she's not, she's feeling more tired as the days go by. And whilst admitted, her prolactin level was checked and it was 2,300, which led us to have a clinical suspicion that the patient was not being compliant with the medication because of the side effects, which was which she has reported several times. Um, at this point, the endocrine team were involved and they changed her cabagulin to bromocryptin. The patient was then discharged home. However, the patient did express on the next follow-up in the clinic that she wanted to have, she wanted to explore having children and she wanted to also explore not being on medical treatment for this condition. Um, at this point, we did a full uh, pituitary profile for her, which is on the system. All of her like, pituitary profile were within normal range, except for the prolactin, which is very elevated. We did also measure her macro prolactin levels, and it showed a high bioactive prolactin of 1,525. She also had an MRI scan done of her brain to check for the, on the pituitary which showed a pituitary mass on the right side, which measured at seven millimeters, which, was, which led us to diagnose her with a micro adenoma at the time with the rising prolactin is a micro prolactinoma. She was then referred to the pituitary MDT, which led us to have a discussion with the neurosurgeons who advised that she should be for stealth-guided transfernoidal surgery to remove it. In lieu with the patients not having good response to medical management and the fact that she wanted to explore having children. So she had the surgery done. And thankfully she had no post-surgical complications and happily she became pregnant three months post-surgery and she has a very healthy young boy at this point. However, she then comes back in 2001, reporting recurrence of the amenorrhea since January of 2020. She did not want to go ahead with further medical management in lieu with what she went through in the previous management with uh, cabagolin and promocryptin and so forth. So she had uh, another MRI done, which showed a four millimeter right side pituitary mass which meant that there was a recurrence of the previous tumor. And then she was sent for the pituitary MDT one more time as she wanted to explore uh, further surgical management because they had a good outcome for her previously. And the MDT all, uh, stated that there's no increased risk of her having a second operation compared to the first operation that she had. And her prolactin levels were once again, very high at 1,360. And her bioactive prolactin was also high. So she's had the second surgery. However, this time around, she did have some post-surgical complications, predominantly diabetes insipidus, for which we treated her with desmopressin. However, she still continues to report having ongoing polyuria and polydipsia when we trial um, to stop the desmopressin for her, which was unfortunate, but she's still on it. She was also been started on hydrocortisone because she's developed, um, her cortisol levels were low after the second surgery. Happily, she's had four periods since the surgery, which means she's had a good outcome in that sense and that she's planning to have further pregnancies with her partner. That's where we're at with it at this point with this patient. So the question to the, for discussion is, how would you manage this patient's microprolactinoma in the first instance? And secondly, 
what are the chances for the neurosurgeons? What are the chances of reoccurrence after the second surgery? And what would you recommend as the next step? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll open it out to the audience here. Uh, there's one hand going up. I'm just going to do one from the chat uh, before we do one in the room, uh, which I think probably many patients were wondering, sorry, many patients, <laughs> many <laughs> clinicians were wondering, any particular reason to start quinagolide? I just wondered if you wanted to talk to I us I did about ask that. that question as well when I first came across the, that was just the choice of the clinician that first saw her. He just started that and uh, there was no specific reason. Can, can I just say, around 2016, I'm over here, 2016, yes, there was I this move, was this. this move when uh, the drug company that made quinagolide told us all that it doesn't cause heart disease. And you might remember at that time, there was a bit of a scare and we all were a bit nervous about it heart disease. Fine. That turned out to be a false scare, but a lot of people did start to use quinagolide for about a year, I think that happened. Mm. That might be why it happened. Another question here, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, interesting case. Um, can, can I ask, I mean, what were the patient's real presenting problems? Because uh, gonadotropins were completely normal. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to check with you, I mean, I mean, apart from amenorrhea, did she have galactoria? Or? So she, uh, she didn't have galactoria. But did she you try withdrawal headache. bleed? Huh? Did you try for withdrawal bleed? Did you give her some medroxprogesterone or something like that to see whether she was no, getting any withdrawal bleed? Not done, no, it's interesting. I mean, Karim, any comments on that? Because the gonadotropins were completely normal. Yeah. Mm. yeah, well, it's a good thought in terms of the normal way that one could progress these things, although the outcome has been successful. So I think that's quite important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? There's, there's some on the chat, actually, if you want me to do a couple from there. So one of the questions, in fact, two people have asked, um, what was the histology report? Did it confirm? Oh, yes, it did confirm a prolactinoma. Okay. Yeah. It was positive for that, and I think the K was um, K was what yeah. five percent for her. Sorry? I think it was three percent, wasn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And then the other question, well, another question which I thought was very good was, um, uh, was that I would have thought it would have been better for a non-compliant patient not to have transnodal surgery. So you, you mentioned that, sh that you didn't think this patient was very... No, she compliant. was not being compliant because her prolactin level, despite showing good response when initially started on cabagolin, she, because she was having severe side effects, she did mention that she, she has like times where she goes off the medication in order to combat the side effects. But, so the non-compliance is really the side effect yeah, profile yeah. rather than uh, no. uh, not wanting to take the tablets. Yeah. Do we think this lady has any mental health diagnosis? Oh, no. Cause unrousable somnolence is not a typical yeah. side typical effect side of cabergolin. Yeah. That's why she was admitted, but she did say that she was feeling generally unwell leading up to that period. But she doesn't have any uh, mental health. Can I just health. ask, when, you, when she took regular, um, I don't know if she was able to ever take a regular dopamine mm -hmm. agonist if she had all these side effects. <laughs> did you ever achieve I suppose I'm just thinking that if one doesn't achieve a normal serum prolactin, one often then starts to think about dopamine agonist resistance as well. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get a decent amount of dopamine agonist regularly and did the prolactin ever come down sufficiently? No, to... we didn't. We didn't get to that stage. Okay, I, can I, comment. I think I, I reviewed the patient in the second episode. I think the first episode was seen by another clinician. But when I, I met her for the first time, she told me straight away that she wanted to be referred to the surgical team. And luckily, Mr. Pollock is the same surgeon who did the surgery before, and she was very keen to go for surgery straight away. Um, and we never tried, um, we never gave her a trial for any medication in, sure. in her second exactly. appointment mm -hmm. when she came with Amelia a second time. So, well, I can run up here, hang on. I do have a question. When I'm going out there, I think it's worth saying that we might be using more surgery for prolactin. For a long time, we always mm -hmm. use cabergolin, but we're seeing side effects, we're seeing psychiatric issues, and so maybe we're going to use more surgery. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that was a question I wanted to ask, I mean, ask the audience and Karim, uh, because yes, on one side, you had a successful outcome with regard to surgery, but then she ended up with diabetes insipidus and oh. cortisol insufficiency, was it? so? 
it's a bit debatable. Mm -hmm. That was the second surgery. Well, it's always a trade-off. When you go down the surgical route, you know most of these cases will do very well, as, you, as this patient did first time. Yeah. She had a good outcome. Second time, second surgery is a bit more difficult. And uh, sometimes you might not be able to remove it all. And uh, when you're trying to remove it all, you might end up having complications, I said. Having said that, you asked about the question about recurrence after first surgery. It's not unusual. I've just seen a patient last week. After five years, a complete resolution. You know, um, the, her uh, periods came back and, and, and she was very well. About five years later, now she's back to where she was. There was still mm -hmm. recurrence in that cleft where the tumor was, pretty similar to your case. You do get recurrences. And, and even if you find that you've taken most of the tumor out first time, uh, you cannot be 100% sure. You know, like Cushing's, you know, they come back years later, similar to that. I think any of these function tumors could come back years later, even though it may be a, a fairly radical excision first time. Yes. Uh, a, Sorry, Mark. Running off my lunch. <laughs> it's reasonable to consider as a dose sparing effect. I mean, you may need to maintain them on a lower dose of dopamine agonist, and they may tolerate that lower dose. So that's a reasonable approach. But um, as you can see, just surgery on its own doesn't seem to be that effective on its own. Mm. I guess the other point to make from the pregnancy perspective is that actually, even on when you managed to have her on some dopamine agonist therapy, her prolactin never went below 1,900, no. did it? No. And we know that even if it's borderline elevated, there can be effects on implantation then. Mm -hmm. So I think you were a bit stuck, weren't you, in terms of treatments that you offered her. Um, and at least you got her to where she wanted to get to, yeah. which was to have a baby, right? Which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that's a really well-made point because you're, you're right, you know, you've got a trade-off, you've got DI, haven't you? But you've also got fertility, which is what she wanted, and you were very stuck about what your options were, in fairness. All right, if there are no more questions from the team. So should we move on to our next talk? I'd like to invite Dr. Inaya to present their case. And she's going to be presenting a case, a rare case of Sheehan syndrome. Thank you. Hi, so my name is Venus Shalaitan. I'm from Bristol Royal Infirmary Hospital in Bristol. Myself and Tariq, we are registrars working over there. And we have an interesting case uh, we are going to share with you. I will first do the case study and the discussion around that. And Tariq is going to uh, go through the case in detail. And we have got questions at the end. So we present a case uh, presented in August this year, 47 years old female who was Somalian speaker with limited English and son was the main interpreter for her. She was admitted with epigastric pain, weight loss and lethargy. Initially seen by the ED doctor who put past medical history as hand eczema, vitamin D deficiency and gastric reflux. <laughs> The working diagnosis by the ED team was acute coronary syndrome or aortic dissection. She had the bloods that showed normocytic anemia. Her ECG and CT angiogram ruled out any cardiac cause of her presentation. Then she was finally seen by the medical registrar on call, who diagnosed her as having either gastritis or upper GI bleed and planned for outpatient endoscopy. Before she was discharged, she was posted by the endocrine consultant who took past medical history as having three children in the past and lived with husband and a 24 year old son. Two elder children died during the Somalian civil war she moved to UK in 2004 and had amenorrhea since delivery of her third child in 1998, which was complicated by major postpartum hemorrhage. 
at that stage, provisional diagnosis was made and requested hematinics, full pituitary profile to exclude partial panhypopituitarism, Sheehan syndrome. Her results, including the pituitary profile, show severe iron deficiency anemia and panhypopituitarism with serum cortisol of 115 and profound hypothyroidism with free T3 of less than 1.5 and free T4 of less than 1.3. She was diagnosed to have Sheehan syndrome with panhypopituitarism and iron deficiency anemia secondary to profound hypothyroidism. She was started on hydrocortisone and sick day rules education was given and eventually then started on levothyroxine and a plan was made for outpatient MRI pituitary and DEXA scan and a further plan to discuss an endocrine outpatient clinic for growth hormone replacement, hormone replacement therapy. And this is the MRI she finally had um, as outpatient that showed anti -cellar. So what happened since 2004? Going back before she moved in UK in 2004, she had a third child um, delivered in 1998, which was complicated by major postpartum hemorrhage. She then moved in UK in 2004 and between 2004 and 2022 current year, misdiagnosis, she was diagnosed initially as premature ovarian insufficiency in UK. And when she went for fertility workup in 2008 in UK, she was reviewed by the specialist fertility services and no diagnosis was made. She was diagnosed with anemia in her previous clinic letters, but nobody looked at whether there was any endocrine cause that can be associated with that. 24 years without replacement, without any hormone replacement. What will be the impact on the patient and her family? And given Somalian and language barrier and all the communication, all the dilemma there. It's a human story, which is a sad indeed. Now I'll pass on to Tariq to discuss about Sheehan syndrome. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Tarek, I'm an endocrine registrar in Bristol Royal Infirmary. I'll talk in brief about Sheehan syndrome. Sheehan was described in 1937 by British pathologist Harold Leeming Sheehan. Current incidence in the developed world is 5.1 per 100,000 women. Current incidence in the developing world is unknown. In Kashmir, India, 63% of the women with Sheehan syndrome had given birth at home. The definition of Sheehan syndrome is hypopituitarism caused by ischemic necrosis of most of the anterior pituitary gland, which results from spasm in its arterioles, apoplexy, and subsequent pituitary necrosis occurring at the time of severe hemorrhage or shock, usually postpartum, complicating childbirth. 45% enlargement of pituitary gland during the first trimester, 120 to 136% enlargement during first few weeks of postpartum period. History of postpartum hemorrhage, failure to lactate, and cessation of menses are important clue to the diagnosis. Postpartum hemorrhage, WHO definition, blood loss more than 500 ml within 24 hours after birth. Severe postpartum hemorrhage, blood loss more than 1000 ml within the same time frame. In UK, postpartum hemorrhage, one to 6% of all deliveries. Maternal mortality, Central Africa, significant number 1150 per 100,000. Postpartum hemorrhage is the leading cause, 50% of the total number of deaths, according to WHO in 2019. 
maternal mortality in UK, 8.8 .8 per 100,000 in UK. Mortality from postpartum hemorrhage is 0.6 per 100,000. A European Journal of Endocrinology published in 2014, 114 patients with Shian syndrome. The mean diagnostic delay was 19.7 years, 55% ban hypobutyterism, and 45% partial hypobutyterism. So before question, also other differential diagnosis of Shehan syndrome, one of the cases presented today is lymphocytic hypophysitis. Thank you for presenting this case. So the question is, could this delay in diagnosis and the management have been prevented? Other uh, question, what interventions we can take in future to help with early diagnosis and the prompt management? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that lovely case presentation and also for the overview of the literature. Thank you. I'll just start by making a quick comment, if I may. First of all, it's a very sad lesson. You're absolutely right in terms of making sure that we can take histories and I guess the barriers we have for people who can't speak English, isn't it? But also, I suppose, also a reminder back to Mona's talk this morning where she talked about how the commonest cause of hypophysitis worldwide is actually postpartum hemorrhage and Sheehan syndrome, isn't it? And I think it's a testament to the obstetric care that we have access to in the UK that we see this so rarely. So do we have any questions from the floor at the moment at all? Mm -hmm. There's one here, brilliant, Bernard, I'll pass this to you. Are you able to comment on the <laughs> sodium level? Did you have hyponatremia? And if so, might that have been a clue? Um, she had mild hyponatremia. And we looked at the trend of hyponatremia when we started the steroid replacement, it eventually improved. We were more keen to see the um, anemia improvement after uh, the correction of hypothyroidism with levothyroxine um, because the take team, they uh, requested outpatient endoscopy, which we finally had to cancel because it was profound hypothyroidism that can read, um, and causing anemia. And another aspect of these cases is the hypothyroidism not slightly protective of the effects of the hypocortisolemia. And that makes the clinical presentation a bit harder to detect for people's well, I, I mean, from my understanding, these are indolent presentations, aren't they? There's a reason it's 19.7 years to diagnosis isn't there. So I'm not sure that there is, you know, with the exception of knowing her history, poor woman, when we first assessed her with fertility services or what have you. I'm not sure they could have been much more to pick this up any quicker. There are multiple reasons why this case was not picked up. First of all, because of the background she came up with from Somalia, language barrier, and all these things. And secondly, um, uh, I think the, um, the communication or the teamwork between the fertility services and the endocrine services, they need to uh, improve further so that we have like uh, more MDPs and more in touch with them in kind of communication so that these cases we can see really fantastic yeah. as well. very good point we have a question at the back i'm just wondering if at the point where she was diagnosed with poi or where she was seen by fertility services if anybody had ever checked an fsh for her yes so they checked uh, hormones but nobody checked for the uh, pituitary profile they looked at the ssh lh prolactin and at one point, they labeled her as hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. But the point here is, is the Sheehan syndrome is a big clinical picture, and nobody looked into the wider aspect of it. And hence, she missed the vital hormones throughout, like 25 years is a big chunk of her life. So we looked at the clinical assays, and we couldn't see any hormones being done apart from her gonadal hormones. Yes, that answers one of the questions on the chat, actually. And just before I come to you with the old Karim will give you a microphone, Mark. Uh, someone has made the point, which I totally agree with. Wasn't she lucky to have an endocrine consultant on the post take <laughs> ward round? <laughs> and what if I've been an endocrine consultant? I'm just thinking about my own post take ward round experience and the number of patients one needs to get through. So hats off to the endocrine consultant. I have to say that was tremendous. Bradley, um, she was fortunately the post take consultant. 
and she picked up that. Otherwise, I'm not sure she would have been lost again. In the I hear you. I hear you. Very, very interesting case. The, the, the anemia, was it definitely iron deficiency anemia? So she had low iron levels and um, she had low iron levels. And before the, um, so the take team requested the endoscopy and before we um, moved on to give her iron infusion, um, we wanted to see what her iron, uh, what her um, hemoglobin and anemia is after the levothyroxine replacement which eventually improved. So, so, which is quite interesting to see. It didn't require anything, any further investigations. <clears throat> I, mean, I think it is a question of where you pitch up, isn't it? And um, amenorrhea is one of those things that can pitch up either in fertility clinical gynae or with us. And hypogonotrophic hypogonadism is not a diagnosis, it's a description and no, endocrinologist with not pituitary function it does make me wonder what rare gynae problems we're missing that are kind of <laughs> I totally agree with you because wherever she went she complained of tiredness and anemia and when you put together whole picture along with amenorrhea and yeah, so I think this is and they're saying a young person um, to be honest, the oh, sodium sorry. was not very low. It was not a um, yeah. I think um, the team might not uh, pick that up when she came in because it was not very low. Um, even if it was low, I think when she came in, when they took the past medical history, nothing was the jigsaw. It was the puzzle that was not put together, and hence I think. <laughs> Um, I think the key point here is the history, especially the take team, because it's not the endocrine people who, who need to take that history. I think um, Amy Nuri with past bottom hemorrhage and all that stuff, I think it's the key for everyone. Queen this is just a comment here on the chat, which I'm going to read out. Another aspect of health inequality, artificial anemia in non monetary women requires investigation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, you, you mentioned about tiredness, and I was just thinking, gosh, again, when you're thinking about post-take ward rounds, when one is tired <laughs> oneself, but um, it's just that tiredness is so difficult. We think about that case before the break, the immune checkpoint inhibitors. Again, you know, the cancer patients you're presenting with tiredness, which is so nonspecific, yet could be so representational of, of endocrine or pituitary dysfunctions. It's very difficult, isn't it? I think hindsight's a wonderful thing. I think it was hard work for us because then, discussing the diagnosis with her, with her son and interpreting for her and that she was deprived of all the hormones the last 24, 25 years. So it was really challenging for us at the end when we diagnosed her finally and then seeing her in the clinic and going through all the hormones. It's also fascinating. She made it made it through a fertility appointment without thyroid function. They're so trigger happy about checking it normally, aren't they? <laughs> they, they are, there's a comment in the chat here that says hypothyroid may have missed because they just did the TSH, yes, and of course a good, it's, a good it's point, not raised. Actually, it's a really good point. Um, okay, so ten past three. Should we move on to the mm -hmm. next one, or do we have some more? Yes. Before we move on, can we just check that we've got Dr. Sadiq in the room or on Zoom? Otherwise, we'll go on to Sandy's case. If not. Dr. Siddiqui from Norfolk and Norwich. I'll just check that I can't see. Yeah, you. I am here. Yeah, can you hear? Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Thank Hello. You. Okay. Hello. So, do you want to share your screen? Yeah, let me. Can you see this? We can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, off you go. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Dr. Rana Siddiq, one of the specialist trainee at Norfolk Norwich University Hospital. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, uh, this case uh, where we have uh, uh, 49 years old female, uh, which was uh, previously fit and well. She uh, developed symptoms of visual uh, issues and headache for the last six months. And her uh, predominant feature was peripheral field vision loss predominantly on the left side. Uh, she presented to a local ophthalmologist and uh, uh, they arranged an MRI pituitary for her. But before this could happen, she uh, traveled on vacation to Columbia and missed her appointment. 
while in Colombia, she uh, had a worsening of headache and visual symptoms. And this time it involved more on the right side. So in the next slide, as, uh, these are the Humphreys automated visual field. Uh, and uh, as we can all appreciate that uh, uh, the, there is a, a typical chiasmal lesion on uh, both sides, but uh, predominantly on the left side. Uh, so um, she had a pituitary profile, which showed uh, that her cortisol level was low, but we don't know the exact timing of this. Uh, they also done an ACTH level, uh, which was uh, with a normal range. Her IGF-1 level was low, her thyroid axis and gonadal axis was intact, and she has mild hyperprolactinemia. So over the next couple of slides, we will go through her imaging, uh, which were done in Colombia. Uh, the first image, um, uh, so the first image is the T1-weighted image, uh, which show cellular and supracellular mass uh, distorting the optic chiasm. And uh, the next image is T2-weighted uh, coronal section, uh, which show the same heterogeneous mass uh, 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 obstructing the optic chasm. And as you can see, this is more on the right side and uh, this likely can explain her uh, visual field as we saw the previous slide. So these are again uh, the same images, but these are a pair of image with pre and post contrast uh, studies. Um, as you can see uh, here on the coronal section, uh, this is uh, T1 weighted image, which show a bean shaped structure area within the supracellular aspect. And uh, please note, it hasn't taken up uh, the contrast when we gave this uh, gadolinium uh, and it didn't enhance. So this could uh, uh, mean uh, that this is likely a known humerus uh, area with either fluid or uh, blood. And uh, 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 that could be the reason it hasn't enhanced. Based on her radiological findings and uh, uh, her uh, presentation, she was suspected to have a pituitary apoplexy. She was advised urgent surgery, uh, but she refused it uh, in Colombia and uh, didn't want it to have uh, privately due to financial issues. Uh, she uh, rather preferred to flew back to UK with her condition and uh, she was started on prednisolone uh, uh, when she was uh, on her flight. So then she uh, came to uh, our emergency and exit and department where she had the ongoing headache and also vomiting. She was commenced on uh, hydrocortisone infusion uh, just to treat a potential uh, adrenal crisis. Uh, she uh, was definitely had a bitemporal hemianopia uh, on this visual field again. And uh, her, uh, there was no evidence of ophthalmoplegia or other cranial nerve uh, loss, and there was no other focal neurology. She had uh, uh, biochemistry. Uh, her pituitary profile was uh, again uh, more or less bland. Her cortisol was low, but she was on steroids at that time, prednisolone. Uh, her IGF 1 level remains low, and her prolactin level was slightly uh, high. Then we uh, transported her images uh, to Queen Square uh, and had sought an emergency endocrine consult and uh, she was accepted for uh, emergency transfer to Queen Square's hospital. So she underwent urgent endoscopic transphenidal surgery. And uh, in the next slide, uh, I will show for my known uh, neurosurgical members uh, of the faculty, uh, just these slides, you have already uh, seen the videos uh, of the surgery, but I can just quickly go through. Uh, so the first slide uh, shows that the dura is intact. In the second slide, we can see the dura has incised and flap is open. In the next subsequent slides, three and four, we can see the tumor being resected. Uh, and here we can see uh, in image five that uh, the tumor cavity with the remaining uh, gland tissue. And finally, uh, the fat packing uh, just after the closure. So her post-surgical uh, recovery was uneventful. She, uh, her fluid balance was fine and she didn't have any uh, complication of diabetes in speeders. There was no CSF leak. 
uh, per day to cortisol was uh, 581 nanomole per liter and uh, hence her hydrocortisone was stopped. So we have uh, histology uh, which showed uh, there was no uh, necrosis identified. Uh, it shows that there was patchy ACTH expression and please note there was no Brooks Highland changes. Um, the rest of anterior pituitary hormone immunochemistry was negative. Her transcription factor shows that she was positive for t pitch lineage. Uh, her KI67 proliferative index was nice and low, which was estimated to be less than 3%. So this was overall in keeping with the silent uh, corticotroph uh, macri adenoma based on this histology. So we reviewed her in pituitary uh, clinic in a, roughly three weeks after her surgery. She had uh, uh, post-op headaches and nausea and tiredness. Her visual, uh, visual field uh, uh, was intact. There was no CSF leak. Uh, because of ongoing nausea, tiredness, and headaches, uh, she was briefly trialed on hydrocortisone while we were reassessing her cortisol level, which subsequently were satisfactory, and this was stopped. Uh, she wasn't pushing weight. Uh, her prolactin was normal and her IGF-1 level remained low. Given her ongoing symptoms of tiredness and she was feeling quite rough and her low free T4 normal was at lower end of normal on few occasions. So she was uh, trial uh, on T4. She had one subsequent uh, acute admission in emergency department uh, with worsening headache, but her CT head was unremarkable. This is her uh, MRI uh, done six months following her surgery, which showed uh, uh, good uh, post-op clearance. Uh, this was discussed at uh, Queen Square's MDT, and uh, it was recommended uh, to arrange uh, uh, follow-up MRI in 12 months, given uh, good clearance. And now we are planning to see her uh, in the clinic uh, with consideration for potential assessment of uh, growth hormone deficiency and uh, also uh, will continue to monitor her for any overt pushing feature. So uh, overall, so this is a silent corticotroph adenoma uh, case uh, and uh, the discussion point I will put forward would be what would be the recommended frequency and test for post-operative biochemical screening for silent corticotroph adenomas. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Hi, thank you for this talk. It's really interesting. I started off as a pituitarologist, so I find this very fascinating. Uh, it's, uh, the size of that tumor is not something typical for Cushing's, and there is a discrepancy between clinical picture and the size of adenoma. Um, with a bit of a stretch, I remember when I looked at a, a literature about correlation between staining on histology, and by, I'm by no stretch histologist or histopathologist, there is something about pituitary cells being, <coughs> excuse me, um, pluripotent and uh, omni-responsive. So how do you call the tumor like this? Uh, this is not typical Cushing's. And, you know, it may be just semantics or academic question. I would, I wouldn't consider this Cushing. <laughs> it wasn't Cushing though. It was a silent, silent cortical. Yeah. No, it was silent. Silent yeah. cortical adenoma. You know, do you? Is it? There wasn't. There, there is a phenomena, and correct me. I, I haven't looked this up for a long time. There is a phenomena when the um, when the hormones are rapidly. Um, offloaded from the cells secreting it and that's when you find the staining that's that's not as present as expected but there wasn't a florid clinical picture here in the first place so, so it does make you wonder what kind of cells i guess it's the challenge though if we're calling it a silent corticotroph yes. adenoma we're then potentially not seeing as yeah, many clinical well, signs potentially yeah. am i right and why not silent something else i mean i take your point i take your point yeah Am I allowed to ask yes, a question? Of course you are. <laughs> so my question for this for the speaker, that was a lovely talk, thank you very much, was 
if I've got this right, you've got some residual and your MDT has said a 12 month interval scan and the pathology, and it's quite helpful listening to our thoughts from Zani this morning, we've got patchy ACTH staining, T-pit lineage, so this is a silent cortical trophy adenoma, which we've discussed a few times, an aggressive subtype of tumour. And I just wondered if this were in our MDT, and clearly, look, MDT, the whole point is it's a different series of opinions. Um, I just wondered if I would have done a something like a three-month post-op MRI and been a little anxious about regrowth, seeing we've got a residual and a aggressive uh, histological subtype. I don't know what you thought about that. Yeah, so this was six months was discussed with the MDT and uh, they have uh, commented uh, some residual, but uh, they were happy to arrange that in 12 months. So. It's interesting, isn't it, Lee? Because it does relate to the points that we were making this morning and the three month post operative scan, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think radiotherapy is so difficult, isn't it? Because I think we've really, I think you could hear that at the BES recently. I think we've really, as a group generally of endocrinologists veered away from aggressive radiotherapy and I think we tend to use it more judiciously now but I think that for someone like this I just wondered if we would think about quite a hawkish approach to regrowth and, and irradiating I don't know what anyone thought about that. Was that, a, was that a large remnant I can't remember I mean I looked at the scan it looked okay to me there wasn't a big remnant. Can I go back, back on the slide if you can? can we? show us the pictures again yeah the comment here i think yeah i think structural problem here is more prominent than any secretory problems uh se secretory problem and, and looking at the chi index i'd be more worried about actually physical tumor than than any endocrine phenomena associated with it yeah the post-op scans looks really good especially the t2 coronal i can't really see much of uh, compared to the pre-op i can't really see any major Remnant, I would have been happy with that. I mean, normally as a guideline, we use three months for functioning tumors. But I think from that scan, six months is reasonable and the yearly follow up, then, then after, it's reasonable, I think. And I suppose if you were wondering about radiotherapy, you could say, okay, we've sometimes said, haven't we, with these, at the sign of the first sign of regrowth, that's our sort of action point to refer to radiotherapy rather than going for radiotherapy straight off the bat, I guess. Is there anything on the chat? Oh, sorry, I've got the chat behind me, actually. Not yet. I think with regard to the Cushing's point, just to sorry. say that um, you're right, Cushing's presents with small tumours, partly because the patients are so sick with the, and become really unwell when they can properly Cushing oid. So before it's got big, they're presenting. With silent ones, they don't have that chance to present early, so it might grow and grow and grow. But histologically, I, think, I agree with everyone here. I think it is generally more aggressive than all the other ones that we see. I was just going to back getting you up on that, which was that the, um, the, the KI-67 index isn't helpful here. So they, the ones which are um, silent corticroid, non-ACTH staining, tend to have a low uh, KI-67, less than 3%, but they are actually the more aggressive ones, more aggressive than the silent ACTH staining. Yes. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes, is that nice? That's a W... HO reclassification isn't there of histology from 2017 and that's one of their hit list of aggressive tumours isn't it Jeremy? Uh, on, on approach to um, radiotherapy based on that you see something at three months. So. Thank you. Any so, other questions? <laughs> Do we have any questions on the Zoom or not? I take it. Yeah. I had one quick question. Is that all right? I'm really yes. sorry. Can you just tell me? I'm so sorry, Dr. Sadiq. Um, remind me what the timeline was between. She's obviously got the bitemporal hemianopa, and I wonder, just thinking about the talks that we've heard early this afternoon about apoplexy. Sometimes we have this discussion in the MDT about when's a good time to be conservative versus operating. And I, I presumed in this case, it was because she had a persistent visual field defect. Just could you remind us how long she had the bitemporal hemianopia for? Because it's also started in Colombia, didn't it? So she, she had some, I think, left-sided visual field defect, which was observed by some local uh, ophthalmologist, which, which we don't have results. But uh, then she had uh, that visual field in Colombia in March. 
uh, I think uh, around 12th March. And then subsequently, when she landed to us, she had uh, after five days. So, and that was worse even what she had in Colombia. I think it was quite rapidly progressing. Okay. Can I ask a quick question actually about the apoplexy and flying? Do we worry about that at all? Because it sounds That's like she got on a plane yeah. quite promptly post a diagnosis. Yeah, it's a real concern, especially with the bigger tumors. And if you have ongoing headache, and that is a concern about, especially with air travel, when you have a low pressure, you know that uh, maybe there is some um, change in the intracranial pressure as well. Um, and uh, especially tumors which are bigger, they have a slightly higher risk of uh, hemorrhaging inside spontaneously. But I don't know if there's any literature evidence to prove that. But I, I think that it's a very, it's a very <laughs> sort of concern about it. Thanks very much. The question that was asked um, by the presenter was about the biochemical screening for non-secretory ACTH adenomas developing as secretory function and, and therefore Cushing's therefore biochemically um, refervescing or, or starting from the beginning. So what would we recommend as, a, as our screening modality and how frequent and how do we do that in the long term? Because these patients are going to be need to be monitored potentially for many years to come. Thank you for that, Mark. Does, does anyone have any comments on that at all? It's a good question, Mark, because we've all seen them transform, haven't we? And it's definitely reported. Um, look, I think I'll say my piece, but I'm happy to be shouted down. I wouldn't necessarily routinely screen. I would go very much on clinically, if they're gaining weight, are they hypertensive, all the typical Cushingoid features. And I think if I was then going to screen, I personally would do a couple of late night saliva with cortisols. But you know, a, a, a load, a, an overnight dex is fine too. But I, I wouldn't necessarily see them every year and obligatory do an obligatory screen. I would very much go clinically, because you know that's when that's going to tell you if there's been a transformation. But very happy to have someone else say something different. Yeah. I, I'd be more worried again about the tumor growth than any biochemical um, consequences of it. And I've seen the case. When I worked at Christie's in Manchester, we had all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. So I've seen the cases of, of these tumors being reclassified because they develop different hormonal secretion after a while. Um, it's been described very sporadically in the literature, but I think one has to remain mindful that they may change the hormone that they're secreting. Thank you very much for that. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to invite our next speaker now, Dr. Sandy Nint. Welcome, Sandy. And she's going to be presenting a case entitled Endocrinopathy Behind the Face Mask Follow-Up. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sandy. I'm one of the endocrine registrars currently at St. Mary's Hospital. I just would like to present a case, a follow-up of this case, which I presented in last year's pediatric masterclass. So to recap the history, this is a 44-year-old gentleman presented um, to ED with signs and symptoms of uh, sepsis. His past medical history were uh, hypertension, tension, headache, but um, he's otherwise fit and healthy, full-time full working. And on that mission, he was diagnosed with infective endocarditis, um, which, is, um, which has blood culture positive, and he has vegetation on mitral valve on echocardiogram. However, his infective endocarditis um, was persisted despite he's got six weeks of intravenous antibiotics, and therefore he was transferred to a tertiary cardiothoracic center for further management where he um, required my mechanical mitral valve replacement. And he, has, he was anticoagulated post-surgery. He was on warfarin with INR of 2.5 to 3.5 target. And during the admission in the cardiac center, his acute on chronic headache was investigated by the scans. So um, as you can see on the left-hand side, um, he has a non-contrast CT scan, which shows that he's got a cellar lesions. 
and which is confirmed by the um, on the two MRI images on the right hand side and T1 weighted imaging and then um, pre and post contrast and which shows that he's got cellar lesion also extending into supracellar and inner sinus and clevis. Thankfully, these images all are um, provided from our neuroradiology departments in Imperial. Again, this is the um, uh, Corona T1 weighted pre and post imaging, uh, pre and post contrast and Corona T2. I'm going to play this video, but before that, I just want to tell you about the report said that he's got a approximately 3.9 into 1.8 centimeter pituitary macro adenoma with supracellar extension. And also he has right cavernous sinus invasion. So I'm just going to play this. So therefore he was, a, uh, he was referred to the uh, local endocrinology clinic and on, um, on, in the clinic, when he removed his face mask and the consultant found that he's got typical acromegalic features with supraorbital ridge prominence, he's got significant underbite and macroglossia. And bear in mind that this is during the COVID era and um, facial, face masks were mandatory. So he was wearing the face mask all the time during the admissions. And he also revealed that he has, he had, 10 years of his increasing size of his hands and feet. And also he has long-standing headache, which were not improved by a simple analgesia. Other examinations were unremarkable and his visual fields were normal and no organomegaly. And then blood tests were done and he's, he's got a significant raised IGF-1 level of 137.8 and mild, mildly raised prolactin of 1,119. And acromegaly was further confirmed by OGTT tests, and which is a growth hormone was failure to fail to suppress. And he's got a paradoxical rate of growth hormone with normal glucose throughout the OGTT test. Therefore, he was referred to the uh, pituitary MDT, and um, the initial management recommendation was to start him on mentally lanreotide and to, re for the, uh, to reduce the tumor size and also growth hormone burden and also plan for the neurosurgical review for the planned transvenoidal surgery. On the series of follow-up reviews, we found that he had limited radiological and biochemical response to lanreotide, which we can see that his IGF-1 level of diagnosis 137.8, and after seven months of monthly lanreotide was 121.9. It's not that different. So the frequency of lanreotide was reduced to three weekly and k was added in. At that point, the um, IGF-1 level is still high at 69.3. Unfortunately, while he is awaiting for his, ACE, for his surgery, he had another second episode of infective endocarditis, which he required another lengthy admissions and intravenous antibiotics. And at this point, he was closely monitored by the cardiologists and cardiothoracic surgeons, given that he's got another, he's got cardiovascular morbidities and recent surgeries. And he had a repeat echocardiogram, which shows that he's got evidence of um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and he's, he's got mild transvalvular leak at his a mechanical mitral valve. His LV function was preserved with ejection fraction of 60 to 65%. So at this stage, he required a surgery given that he's got um, cardio cardiovascular comorbidities and he's got two episodes of infective endocarditis and he was um, limited, he had limited response to lamurotide. And this is requiring a multidisciplinary planning for his surgery. And given that he's got high risk um, due to all these factors, and it includes that he has extensive involvement of the cardiologists and cardiothoracic teams. This is a different hospital, so we have different um, meetings across sites. And it's, it's, it includes the assessment of the cardiac function preoperatively. And also there are extensive discussions with hematology team for the safe peri and post-operative anticoagulations. And um, hematology team provided an extensive 
uh, written plans for him, but basically the plan is the withdrawal of his warfarin perioperatively and to bridge with low molecular weight happen. Then he underwent transvenoidal pituitary surgery and the MRI scan from preoperative, and this one is the day two postoperative scan. You can appreciate there is a good resection in the pituitary fossa. And then histology confirmed that sparsely granulated somatotrophic pituitary adenoma with KN67 of 1%, which again explained why he poorly responds to lenalutide injections. However, his immediate uh, post of recovery was complicated by recurrent episodes of apistasis, and it started from day three of his post-op, which is not routinely controlled by surgery flow, nasal packing, and rapid rhino. It was quite massive bleeding. It includes clot. He was daily reviewed by ENT team, endocrinology, neurosurgical team, and hematology teams. Um, however, we had to continue with his, his anticoagulations because of his high risk of mechanical valve related thrombosis. And hematology team also recommended to start him on tranexamic acid, but the bleeding wasn't controlled. And the bleeding was eventually controlled by the surgical ligation of his phenol palatine artery by ENT team in the operation theater. He was um, discharged home on warfarin once INR was in therapeutic range. And he had one month of um, post-operative stay for that. And at the three months post-surgery um, follow-up in, um, in, uh, in the clinics, he mentioned that his headache is back. And also his IGF-1 level started to rise off when he's off treatment. And this is the timeline uh, graph for his IGF-1 level, which shows that um, we can see that at diagnosis, he has the highest IGF-1 and then seven months, just mildly um, changes. And then the, the lowest point was his immediate post-surgery, which is 54.3. And currently it is coming up to 78.7 which also explained from his um, three months post of MRI. And um, this is the coronal T2 weighted imaging. And again, like this is the first on the left side would be preoperative. The middle one is immediate post-op scan. And this, the right-hand side is the uh, three months post-operative scan, which shows that he's got increased size of residual in his right cavernous sinus. And this is another coronal T1 uh, pre and post contrast, which again shows he's got increase in size of the uh, right cavernous sinus uh, residual. He was recently discussed in inferior pituitary MDT, and the plan is to restart him on lanreotide and to proceed with the uh, radio therapy. So to summarize this a, a complicated case, this is a 44-year-old male presented with recurrent episodes of infective endocarditis, which he required mechanical mitral valve and he was anticoagulated. He was diagnosed with acromegaly, confirmed biochemically and radiologically. MRI show he's got pituitary macroadenoma with right cavernous sinus invasion. He had limited biochemical and radiological response to lenalutide. He had a high-risk transvenoidal pituitary surgery because of his anticoagulation and cardiac dysfunction. His immediate recovery was also complicated by episodes of epistasis. Again, he required a, um, surgical management by the ENT team. And this case also highlights the need for involvement of the multiple specialties to optimize patient care, particularly perioperatively. So I have two questions for audience. Um, number one, would earlier diagnosis of his acromegaly have changed his cardiovascular outcome? And number two, does anyone have any experience of managing this kind of patient undergoing pituitary surgery who is on anticoagulation but unable to stop perioperatively? Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you. We have some questions, I think. Um, just uh, Mark. And, and the excellent presentation. Um, what about pivisamont? I mean, what, you know that it's not responding to lanreotide, so what, what about using pivisamont to control it while you're waiting for the radiotherapy to kick in? Sorry, say that again? Pivisamont. Pivisamont. Well, the risk 
a, a theoretical, sorry, sorry, there is a theoretical concern isn't there about tumour increase with pegbestamont and that's why you do the six month and the 12 month post initiation MRI. So I suppose that that bit's the, the concern, would you get sort of increase further? Um, I wonder if, a, if an alternative medical management for him, although he wasn't diabetic at the time we started all of it, would have been perseriotide because the sparsely granulated adenoma that Sandy mentioned, there is some suggestion in the literature, but very case report uh, based, that actually because of the perseriotide effect on the uh, somatostatin 5 receptor, that you might actually get a better shrinkage with these tumours. But again, I suppose it doesn't give you much, there wasn't much change radiologically, I think what was what was difficult. So that's what really we were pushing forward. Although we weren't very nervous, I think, about surgery, it was about the fact we weren't getting any tumour regression with treatment. And I guess Pevismont probably wouldn't have achieved that either, but I definitely take your point. With, with his previous response, it looked like you got more response to cabergolin than valerietide. So, you know, would that be another more cheap and cheerful option while you're waiting for radiotherapy. It's a, good, uh, it's, a good, it's a good thought, and it's funny when you see it mapped out like that. And I guess his prolactin at the start was over a thousand, wasn't it? But it didn't stay in that tumour in the end, actually, for, for prolactin. But uh, I suppose we still only got to 60-something where we wanted 30-something and, and actually not much change radiologically. But you're, you're right. And actually, one of the questions from the chat, whilst I'm just trying to think of keeping everything equal, is someone asked us, actually, it was a really good question, were we worried about using cabergolin given the patient's valvular heart disease, which is a great question, actually. Yeah, I must confess that we weren't. Um, I think probably because in fairness, the data, and I think if those of you that were at the BES where Will Drake reminded us in, in his talk, you know, the data that we have is that there is no association between the doses of cabergolin that we're using in endocrinology and valvular heart disease. And that's a meta-analysis, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of studies now. So it didn't cross our minds. It's a good question, but I think even if I had my time again, I think we still would have used cabergolin. And it's you're quite right. It looks like it was the thing that it responded most to, isn't it, Marcus? Question over here. Oh, sorry. You oh, yeah, I just wanted to know whether, because he's such high risk of surgery, actually, could he have done radiotherapy earlier? Would that have been an option, or would the tumour have been too big to be... Yeah, managed appropriately. Yes, I was going to ask Ramesh to that comment. Was, that on was that. also my question. Yeah, I questions. mean, the, there is a substantial amount of tumour. It's a very reasonable surgical target. I think um, most neurosurgeons will agree to go for surgery, given even though it is high risk. And the, we, as neurosurgeons, often come across situations, which is actually your second question about previous experience in dealing with patients on anticoagulation. And, and uh, there are patients who we deal with, especially uh, who are on double anticoagulants or IV heparin, and we have to stop it and bridge it and do it. So if, if the surgery needs to be done, we got to do it somehow. And it's not a very uncommon situation, but sometimes you come across such cases where we have to operate. But the question about radiotherapy, I mm -hmm. think given the amount of tumor, it's better for radiotherapies as well to reduce the, the tumor, tumor bulk before you go down the radiotherapy route. Because once you're given radiotherapy, I think surgical option will be much more limited in future as well, because you know, people will be hesitant to operate at that time. So surgery followed by radiotherapy is often a better choice. Uh, thank you. My, my point is not nearly so academically sort of uh, astute, but I think if I'm rightly, Karim mentioned about three or four years ago that the whole uh, dopamine agonist thing was a bit of an Italian ruse with regards to <laughs> over prescribing from cardiologists. No, was it was yeah. it Will Drake? But I mean, that's that's always stuck in my mind. So I'm afraid I rather kind of plow on regardless, and I don't. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> and I think Will put up a. He did a great talk a couple of years ago and put up a slide of uh, some Porsches, didn't he? And suggested that the Italian cardiologists were doing well from all the routine echocardiograms that are <laughs> happening now. I can possibly pass comment. Um, Can I ask yes, Emma? <laughs> comment on, on the multidisciplinary nature of this case, because I remember being the consultants on the wards at the end after the nosebleed had happened. And I have to say that on, in this trust, haematology is on a different site, cardiologists on a different site, and it can be complicated. 
but the key was actually to have named people responsible and and I think me did a fantastic job in managing that but it, I think it was much better to be able to deal with a specific haematologist because it wasn't fair for the on-call SPR every other day and, and, you, and I noticed that you got and this is just a general comment about managing complex patients you get a very sensible response but it's not tailored to that specific case so um do push it upwards and do find the named individual if you need to because that really closed the loop and I actually managed to I remember it clearly he was sitting on the ward and, and we managed to speed up getting him home because there was this set protocol for up titration and warfarin but when we looked through we were able to at least finally speed that up a little bit but I didn't have to deal with the scary nosebleed so thank you thank you well, I will just say it's funny actually like, it's true for all the presenters today you look at uh these cases that it's distilled to a couple of slides on a PowerPoint and Sandy and our and my serum cortisol during this whole experience must have been more than an insulin tolerance test because actually you know you distill all these different difficult cases don't you into a couple of slides but actually when you're managing them they're all incredibly complex and they require lots of conversations and it just becomes a couple of sentences but it's actually a lot of work isn't it could I ask a quick question on the cardiology front? I noticed in the abstract he was labelled as having a diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, am I right? With the gift of hindsight, do we think that could have been acromegalic cardiomyopathy or not? He was diagnosed with, um, they were saying about left ventricular hypertro hypertrophy quite specific before for the diagnosis of this uh, valvulopathy. So it was before he was admitted with infective endocarditis. Okay, so all right. I think we could be related that is, it could be he's got uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He may have some valvulopathy because for interestingly, he has the first, the first uh, bacteria growth in the black culture was strep aurelis. So he said he had dental work like um, a month before. And then he's got this strept or less blood culture positive um, infective endoc endocarditis. Okay. So if you want to follow Occam's grace, since there's only one cause, he had acromegaly first, he caused heart disease, his teeth began, became separated, he then had dental work, <laughs> he then got strep aurelis, <laughs> and he got AF and so on. It could all be acromegaly, couldn't it? Very unifying, yes. <laughs> Because actually, has he had any post-op um, echoes at all or not? Uh, have we seen any improvement in his... I'm not too sure about the post Because I know... Good question, because he's at Harefield, hence the, the multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary thing. So um, it's a good question, actually, because you would imagine, wouldn't you, that if you've got some improvement in growth hormone burden, although, of course, his IGF-1 shot up again, so you almost want it to be a bit better for a while beforehand, but it's a, it's a good point. Do we have any questions on the Zoom no, at all or not? That last one was about um, not using gabergelin. Yes, I think we're all happy with using gabergelin in heart patients, cardiac patients. I think anyone, anyone else in here? Okay, so I think we've covered the afternoon draws to a close thank you so much to our speakers thank you to all of you at at home on or in the office on zoom and then here in the building lots of great discussions a couple of pleas from us just please fill in your survey give us some feedback and you can get your cpd certificate um, a plea from me just to take your cups otherwise i'll get my wrist slapped for having cups in the room and then if you do fancy a cup of tea and a sweet treat on the way home there's tea and coffee downstairs thank you very yeah, much